Good morning, members, officers, and members of the public that are joining us for the Place and Resources Scrutiny Committee on the 10th of November at County Hall in Dorchester. My name is Councillor Shane Bartlett. I'm the chairman of this committee. The officers attending for overall gender are John Selgren, Executive Director of Place, Aidan Dunn, Executive Director of Corporate Development, Jonathan Mayer, Director of Legal and Democratic, and George Dare, Senior Democratic Service Officer. Other officers will be introduced and required during the meeting. Now, please remind members, um, when you use your microphone, you must press the button to switch off your microphone after you've spoken, as the system only allows one microphone to be in use at any one time. The red light means that your microphone is on and the camera will automatically pan towards you. Please also note that the microphone should not be moved. Please speak directly into the top of the microphone to try and avoid turning your head away from when speaking. I'm changing the agenda order. Agenda, um, agenda item eight, property and strategy and asset management plan update will now be dealt with agenda item seven. So if I can move to item one on the agenda, apologies. Do we have any apologies, Mr. Dare? Good morning. Good morning, we have apologies from councillor Mark Roberts. Thank you. I'll move to agenda item two the minutes to confirm and sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 17th of October 2022. Does any member have any issue they wish to raise over the minutes? In which case, members of here no dissent, I'll take the minutes as accepted. Thank you. Agenda item three, declarations of interest. Does any member have a declaration of interest they wish to make and if so, the action they will take? Thank you, members. If you do find one during the meeting, if you please make it known when we come to the item. Agenda item four, chairman's update, land charges update, um, and we're gonna have a, a re latest report from Miss Evans, who's head of legal services. Miss Evans. Thank you, chairman. Morning, members. Um, as Chairman has just said, I'm here to provide an update this morning on land charges. And before I start that, I just want to introduce you to a couple of members of the land charges team um, who've come along with me this morning. Um, so sitting next to me is uh, Michelle. Michelle is one of our senior land charge officers. And next to Michelle is Ilan. And Ilan is also a land charge officer within the team. Uh, so, as you will know, over the last 12 months, the committee have received updates about land charges response times. Um, as a reminder, the council's responsible for processing land charge search requests, which are commonly made um, as part of property purchases. Uh, the government has a target of a maximum of 10 working days within which these searches should be returned to applicants. Um, I am pleased to inform you that for the first time since October 2020, searches are now being returned to applicants within 10 working days. The average response time for October uh, was eight working days, and we've returned 82% of searches in October within the target 10 working days. This has taken a huge effort uh, by the team, uh, and supported by colleagues particularly in planning um, and in transformation. Uh, to remind you of some of the context, um, I first reported to your committee in September 2021. Uh, at that time, uh, a delay in response times had built up due to a combination of unexpected and sustained surge in the housing market, some staff vacancies, uh, and all of that while the, while the team were uh, migrating to a new uh, IT system. At the time of my report in September 21, uh, vacancies had already been filled, additional staff had been employed and were being trained, uh, and response times were published on the Council's website. Uh, your committee agreed with proposed actions to reduce waiting times, and since my first report, I've provided regular updates to your committee on progress. Uh, and that includes updates on response times completion of system migration, some refinements to search processing, and creation of a single email address for inquiries. Shortly after my first report to your committee in September 21, uh, response times hit their peak of 62 working days, 
However, since October 21, response times have reduced as planned uh, and are now at eight working days. Uh, the committee may be interested to know that in each of the last three years, we have received and processed at least double the number of searches uh, per year than pre-COVID, uh, and we've not yet seen any signs of search numbers dropping. Uh, the team continue to look for improvements with search processing. Uh, they work closely with the planning transformation project and in the coming months we'll be arranging for search requests to be both submitted and also paid for online uh, and work to review, converge and harmonise the legacy land charge registers. So I again want to apologise to those people whose searches were delayed. I want to thank officers in the team and colleagues in other services for their work and support to improve the response times and make improvements to the service. I hope that those buying and selling houses and this committee are reassured by the progress that has been made. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Evans. And while obviously it was disappointing the way the members of the public were um, impacted on those search times um, and, the, and the time it was taken, um, we were, as a council authority, obviously put in an impossible position um, by central government at that time, and we didn't manage to get the infrastructure in place. Uh, it's really reassuring now to hear that those um, search times are back as they should be, um, and I can't thank your team enough for the work that you've done on that. I know it has been quite a mountain to climb, um, and I think it's been difficult to comprehend for a lot of members within the council authority just what you were up against, I know, because we've spoken. Um, but I think you've done a fantastic job and the team's done a fantastic job and I really appreciate the, the amount of work that's gone into it. Um, I'm happy to open up to members of the committee. Um, Councillor Andrews. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. I, I'd also like to add my thanks to uh, Ms. Ms. Evans and her whole team for a fantastic job they've done to get to, to where they are today. We were put in an impossible position um, along with the IT uh, changes that were in place as well. Um, so to get where they are today in that time that they've, then they've promised and they haven't missed a promise um, uh, uh, target date all the way through. So absolutely fantastic effort and I'd like to thank them. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Councillor Took. Yeah, I'd like to add my own congratulations. I think the, the team has done an excellent job in getting back from, what was it, 62 days down to eight. Um, I note that the this was achieved with, with help from staff from elsewhere within the council. Are you sufficiently resourced now to do this and keep doing it and keep the good work up? Or do you still require assistance or further resources? Um, so if, if we can just establish where we are set to go forward, I think I'd, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Evans. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, we did, uh, at a very early stage, have support from officers across other, other services, um, but the staff is now fully resourced. Uh, we've maintained the additional numbers of staff uh, that we employed just over a year ago, um, and I'm, I'm reassured that we have sufficient numbers of staff within the team uh, to maintain the, the search response times that we currently have. We will, of course, be keeping them closely monitored um, uh, and we'll be ready to, to act uh, if search response times look like they're going in the wrong direction. But I don't anticipate that. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Are you satisfied, Councillor Took? Yeah, thank you. Did you wish to speak? Thank you. Um, that's reassuring, um, especially since I, I'm very pleased that you've been able to retain the staff that you employed because one of the problems the council seems to have been having over the last couple of years or more is, is that staff churn has been a little high, I think. But we might uh, possibly look at that a bit later on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Took. Um, Councillor Canning. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I want to add, add my thanks as well. I, I think you, you, you've done an impressive job of turning this around. 
And I think we're all very grateful for, for your hard work and the whole team's hard work in, in, in doing so. I suppose the only caveat is, is, is really, uh, or the last bit of reassurance that we as members need to know, is that this gets picked up, if things were to go wrong again in the future, that it would get picked up much earlier. Because um, it, it is a shame that things got to, to 62 days in the, in the first place before real intervention took place. I, mean, I, I don't know if you now have a level where it would automatically trip some alarm or something that would show up if, if, if things were a, a problem. Um, if you want to comment on that. Uh, yes, thank you. I can confirm that we do uh, monthly performance monitoring um, in addition to my one-to-ones and meetings uh, uh, with the, the team leader for the land charges team. Um, so, yes, I'm reassured that if we see figures going in the wrong direction, uh, that we'll be able to pick that up early uh, and make some plans to get ourselves back on track. Okay, thank you. If no other members wish to speak, then uh, from the chair, again, thank you to you and your officers, Ms. Grace. Um, excellent, excellent um, job that was done. Sorry, Miss Evans, I beg your pardon. Um, excellent job, thank you. So I'll move to agenda item five, public participation. We have no questions from the public. Agenda. Sorry. Yeah. And agenda item six, questions from members, and we have no questions from members. However, I do have a statement on car parking from Councillor Bryan, portfolio holder. Councillor Bryan. My screen's gone bad on me, but I know the, uh, the details on it. There's a lot of things that are happening within car parking at the moment. Okay, can you hear me? If, if that's possible, while I, when I find it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Pardon. Property Strategy and Asset Management Plan Update, Agenda Item 7. Um, recommendation is that Scrutiny Committee review and comment upon progress in achieving the actions identified in the Property Strategy and Asset Management Plan, and that Scrutiny Committee notes the intention to develop a new strategic asset management plan. And presenting, we have Mr. Mr. Hopkins, the Corporate Director for Assets and Property, um, and to include a PowerPoint presentation, as I understand it. Mr. Hopkins. Thank you, Chair, Committee. Good morning to you all. Um, yes, there's a short presentation to run through to go through that, Chair, and, and committee members, uh, which will set out the progress since the adoption of the programme uh, in, the, in 2020. Um, I'm the new corporate director, started in January uh, 2022 this year, so um, this, is, this is the update of where we're coming through. Uh, front is being driven by the front, so if we could, thank you. Um, so... The Council adopted a strategy and asset management plan uh, by Cabinet in November 2020. And this, this sort of sets out what's been happening since that period in time. Um, there was a restructure, segment restructure of assets and property which was undertaken last year, and that then concluded in my appointment in January. Shortly after uh, my appointment, uh, post discussions with the executive director and others, uh, I then moved, we moved across the, then the growth and economic regeneration function, which originally sat uh, with, with the corporate director for environment, transport and infrastructure. Um, and is recognizing over the last two or three years since that adoption, November 20, all this has been undertaken against the backdrop of Brexit, COVID, Ukraine crisis, now the cost of living. So from a property and regeneration point of view, this has been some of our most challenging time. In my 38 years in local authority, uh, this has been uh, an exceptional period of the last sort of two or three years for this organisation. So what's the role of assets and regeneration in terms of coming forward? Uh, and effectively it is that it's, our role is to support Dorset Council to achieve its strategic priorities, to make sure the organisation is financially and environmentally sustainable to generate that high-performing team and a culture uh, with an underpinning operating model. So the organisation is clear, stakeholders are clear, members are clear, how we process, allocate and deliver. 
against what the council needs to deliver to operate as a council. Uh, and as part of that, April, uh, that October 2020, there was the incorporation of the corporate landlord model and delivering a successful capital programme, recognising change of the estate and the portfolio was needed to enable services to deliver key high-performing frontline services to our residents. Um, so that's what we're trying to drive through against the asset and property uh, model. How we achieve that, I don't know, it's a, maybe a bit small to come through, but we've got um, a purpose is to say, provide and sustain an operational and investment property portfolio that's safe, flexible, and represents value for money, enabling, the, say, the council to deliver on its policies to services to our clients, partners, and stakeholders. On the left-hand side is our strategic priorities, and that's embedding the revenue savings and income generation targets improving our net financial position and, and enhance our value for money. And I'm sure our Section 151 officer is very uh, helpful for that position. And how we do that through a portfolio consolidation. Uh, also, recognising this is later on the agenda, you know, property plays a critical role in helping this organisation drive its contribution to net zero um, and actually enhance the user experience. So making sure what we are building and adapting is fit for future, flexible and adaptable to meet the demands and needs of our residents and our services. And we're doing that on the right hand side by yeah, establishing our operating model, um, being client driven and focused. So absolutely listening to what our services and residents are asking for and then adapting that to work. Working closely across our supplier market, helps the procurements and our colleagues there to make sure we can harness that Dorset pound and the capability of the supply chain. Engaging effectively as part of outside of us, our stakeholders through health opportunities, uh, you know, other stakeholders who can actually help us engage around that portfolio consolidation, but also where they're going on their strategic property journey so we can inline. A key one for me is managing performance, demonstrating we are actually delivering that value for money. What is the cost, as I call it, of the widget for us driving the process? And then using Dorset's unique environment to help benefit off and you know, provide us as an employer a choice, the opportunity to help support colleagues for housing, employment, opportunities and economic growth. So that's the, the purpose effectively of assets and regeneration uh, as we're trying to drive that forward. In terms, sorry, if we, next slide, thank you. Um, so as part of the role of coming in, um, we are swapped to undertake a number of couple of audits to, to look at how we were performing against the uh, original October 2020 and also around some health and safety compliance issues. Um, I don't make an apology for what you're seeing on the screen. Um, the challenges the organisation faced with the impact of COVID and being a new emerging young council, the audit did identify some weaknesses in the report uh, and actually how we were implementing that. Uh, the organisation recognised that in terms of that stability and therefore my ability to come in as the, 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 a stable corporate director with a clear focus and direction for the next five years has meant we are making great strides against that original audit report and implementing changes to the organisation, um, which will come on later into the report. Uh, the news, at the, the second bullet point though, is as I said, they, they were satisfied that whilst we recognise there were weaknesses, we've been putting into place over the last four to five months some building blocks to be able to deal and tackle with those complex changes, uh, particularly in terms of how we're driving forward some of those priorities. What it has led to is a need to develop a more strategic asset management plan, which we're aiming for by May 2023, which will set out and be very clear as a living document for this organisation, that breadth of work we do across assets and regeneration, how it independent and is a central core function to help us as a council drive a number of abilities against a corporate uh, approach. Next slide, please. Uh, out of that, the October 2020 original cabinet paper, there were a number of actions, uh, and now we're moving into what we've achieved from that uh, period in time. Uh, the first one was operational asset reviews. The, there is a review process and a no timetable clearly in place. And this is meant to identifying, as you appreciate, the, the, it's part of the local government uh, review and the merger of a number of assets across a number of authorities. It's taken the team uh, some time to actually get to the bottom of actually understanding exactly what assets were coming across as part of that review, understand how they're operating and actually what our opportunity is. Uh, we are on track to complete that asset out by 2024. Um, 
reviews have been ongoing and we are in an extensive engagement with services around through the corporate landlord model how that affects and operates to go forward Me remembering all this is underpinned by that golden thread of rationalization consolidate drive revenue and opportunity to capital savings and we've identified a significant list of operational assets currently and have an external uh, company uh, lined up to come in to undertake a review of around circa 50 assets which will report back by spring at the latest uh, their assessment of what the opportunities are for the council to retain, build, develop, sell or release to meet those overriding objectives. Uh, so that, that is currently in play. Next slide please. The second action was around our property strategies, as I hope uh, uh, members would have seen, committee would have seen, since starting, been working very closely in terms of just realigning, resetting some bits and pieces in the direction of travel. Um, and we've been undertaking those conversations across the corporate directors to understand their service strategies. As part of the emerging uh, increase in resources. What we're also building for, for the first time in the department is business partners within the property field who will have experience and understanding of working out with, and touching as other corporate centre uh, teams do. We will have a business partner that will work with the corporate centre, work with children, work with adults, work with housing to help them develop their strategy to help us align the, the operating model. Um, it is dependent though on services sharing forward operational plans um, and what they think their property requirements can be. So we act as the centre under that corporate landlord model to ensure that we can pull, join up the jigsaw puzzle in the centre and be able to demonstrate that actually we can bring collaboration working together uh, going forward. Next slide, please. The third action was around the agile working. So this was the consolidation of the Dorset workplace and, and implementing. It's worth pointing out that the organisation has been successful since coming together to drive out just over a million pound of efficiencies year on year in savings from its corporate portfolio to date. And we're still intending to make further efficiency through that. Um, obviously the impact of COVID, the cost of living crisis, and the supply of information is, is, is proving interesting on how organizations are dealing with workforces back in the workplace. Um, there is no one size fits all approach, hence that terminology of hybrid. And again, we're seeking conversations with our partners of other size organizations in private sector on how they're addressing their own workforce and hybrid operations. Um, I think it's fair to say, you know, we can recognize and see ourselves, you know, County Hall is not that well utilized going forward, yet the car park is almost full every day. So we're still working through how do we help rationalize the portfolio? How do we drive efficiencies out of our corporate offices even further? But making sure we can provide the right flexible hybrid consultative place and team-based approach to the offices so staff can have a, a sense they're in an environment to work in and operate in that is comfortable surrounding our, our duties to make sure it's health, safety and compliance and they can do their function and row correctly. Uh, so we would like to think over the next six to nine months we'll be coming forward with a review further of how we can actually help the organisation drive further efficiencies out. Next slide, please. The action four was covering the adoption of the corporate landlord model. Uh, the adoption process is ongoing. Uh, whilst we've been able to undertake that uh, through the, the corporate offices and buildings, we're still engaging with services in understanding what that means and where the costs are sitting and actually that direction of travel. Um, as part of the review, we've established an asset strategy board, which is member led, which I think has been covered in previous uh, committees. And there's a that, that provides us with a sounding board from an informal basis of guidance. It's a non-decision making board, it's a guidance board that lets us bring forward opportunities to test opportunities for progressing schemes before they go too far into the system. And on the data management system, as you appreciate, there was six councils coming together. The data information it transfer was challenging for the team to adopt you know some authorities did not have a robust system it was just operating off spreadsheets we are slowly and have been aligning against that there was an aspiration originally to get everything onto tech forge by december 2021 however we are almost there but we are now defining a scope and a change to target operating model so we haven't quite got it but we are at a high confidence level we now actually do know most of our assets or the vast majority in excess of 95 96 percent what they're costing us to run and actually what state they are in from a compliance and health and safety point of view next slide please 
So this, this just covers the governance currently you know, that's gone into place. So the, the bit of the asset strategy board is on the left. So I chair the people, schools and uh, people asset management group. If somebody can find me a better name, all thoughts gratefully received, committee. Um, so effectively, myself, the team, working very closely with finance colleagues, et cetera, review the business cases coming forward, opt through the services as part of that business partnering arrangement. We assess it, undertake the reviews, and then the, the process would go off to Asset Strategy Board just for a census check to make sure that it's aligned. Does that feel right? Does that meet the political corporate priorities? Is it the right thing for the place? Uh, it's a soft census check. And then subject to those reviews and comments, we would then develop the full business case into Capital Strategy and Asset Management Group, uh, and then onward into Cabinet. Uh, the, there's a slight tweak to that one because of length of time coming through. The, the top asset strategy board is effectively down the bottom. It'll just go back in a loop again. So we, are, we have actually since updated that since this slide was produced. Uh, but it's a, it's a census check that's not been there to date to be able to have that conversation uh, with, 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 with members. And obviously at all times, what I would say to committee is the team are actively encouraged that if we have work happening, we are also engaging with local members to ensure it meets the priorities and where that overlies with the corporate projects. Next slide. So one of the key areas we identified was resourcing. Uh, and say so when I commenced, we undertook a review uh, of what was needed and actually was the, the, the structure post the ongoing changes in the, the element, you know, able now to meet the new demands the organisation was asking. There has been a significant uh, uplifting capital projects and programmes required. Um, and effectively the outcome review that additional resources were needed. Uh, that money is coming into the system. Grateful to, to colleagues in finance to, to help us make that happen. And we're now into a period of recruitment to identify both to additional senior capacity as well as operational capacity through the deep depths of the team. Uh, I, I can report we had a, an informal conversation with union reps yesterday and that was positively received around actually some of the changes being proposed going forward. So over the next period, the next two or three months, you will see, for example, those business partners coming in to help engage with services going forward uh, to help be able to drive some of those outcomes. The action point seven from that review, sorry, next slide, was around project delivery. Uh, and now as said, we, we now effectively have for the first time uh, it says a full list of property projects in, in one place. We can see that and collect it and understand what's happening across the organisation. We've been identifying and working with colleagues around a priority assessment tool. So again, we can overlay all those projects and prioritise them against the corporate delivery plan. Um, we've been working very closely again, if I can keep saying this with finance, uh, the options analysis tool to help us understand actually what does that mean? So whilst we may have a service request to do something with a particular asset or a piece of land, that option tool says, well, actually, what else could we do? So we test the theory before we deliver to make sure that we're not missing out on something bigger or better that could deliver the same benefits the service is looking for, but actually have a wider benefit to the council. And then say we're still developing the, the business tool that actually you know, control and demonstrate for the council what the true cost of that project will deliver. So not just the capital cost, but the ongoing revenue, the maintenance liabilities, the staffing costs to ensure that there is a complete picture of actually that project going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, Actions eight and nine was that, was the review of the commercial portfolio and other assets. As we said, we, we, we're undertaking that rapid asset review on a number of the assets, and we're on track to complete by 2024. Uh, and we've got export, external appointments, um, Montague Evans, who will help us derive the benefit in the options appraisal out of a number of those sites. So happy to report back on that process as that goes, Chairman and Committee. Next slide, please. And then finally, it was that one public estate. And again, this gives the benefit of what's been delivered um, coming forward. It does, it does sit there. There's a one public estate meeting due at the end of this month. But again, benefits of that have seen us, obviously, the lease of South Hawks House to, to, to the NHS, delivery for the MOD and Army and Navy, a battle lab and the engineering lab at uh, Winfrith, you know, shared office spaces that are happening, you know, natural England within this building and healthcare and that co-located service delivery of libraries going forward. So say all that is contributing to over a million pound of revenue savings this authority has been able to derive since the, the, the 2020 adoption 
of the asset in place strategy going forward. And next slide. It's part of that action 11 was actually how to identify, it was called joint ventures in the paper, but this is around just identifying our strategic partnering opportunities. When we look at the length and depth of the capital program that's been in place, what's our ability to drive and influence and deliver that? And we've got uh, currently uh, consultants appointed who are helping and working again across the, across the organization to help us identify and drive forward solutions and opportunities to actually how can we get the best bang for our buck and the most value for efficiency in terms of some of the bigger projects this council are driving forward? I believe that's the end of the presentation. Is that all right, Chair? Very all right, Mr. Hopkins. Yes, quite a slick performance. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask if either of the executive directors wish to make any comment. Um, Mr. Selgren? Thank you, Chairman. No, not at this stage. I think uh, Mr. Topics has given a very comprehensive uh, presentation, as you've indicated, and I think we'll look forward to receiving members' comments and questions. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, Aidan Dunn, Executive Director for Corporate Development. I'll just make one point in the context of today's uh, topics. So the Council essentially spends its money in three areas. It spends them on staff, it spends them on third parties, and it spends its money on uh, property and assets as well. So it's really important that uh, we keep a grip of all three, and I, it's really useful that we're exploring two of those today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. That's, that's the financial term, is it? Getting a grip or keeping a grip? Thank you. OK, before I go to committee members, I'm going to go to non-committee members, if there's any question or comment that non-committee members would like to make. Sumter. Councillor Sumter. Thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me to ask a question. Um, I'm just wondering that there appears to be uh, many different uh, processes uh, that um, directorates are going to have to go through. Uh, lots of layers, lots of bureaucracy. That's certainly how it feels to me. Um, do you have or will there be targets set for when decisions will be made when projects are put forward? Because clearly there's been delays of which you've outlined the reasons why, but I don't think we want to see any continuing delays. So do we have some targets? Can targets be put in place for how soon projects can be approved or rejected? Clearly, they're going to be different size projects, so there may be some kind of sliding scale, but I think it might be something that um, I'm sure directorates would want to uh, want to see. In terms of the answer, yes, the answer is yes, we are looking to put those targets in place. You're, you're absolutely right in identifying there's no one-size-fits-all approach to how we assess it, but the toolkits and the assessment toolkit will deal with them. Um, the increase in resources will enable us, from a property point of view, to be able to articulate the wider options. And it's not about increasing, but it's just to make sure there's a transparent and true governance process into place to ensure that when the council makes its decision, it's had the full impact of the effects of that decision being made. So there's no intention here of slowing things down. Actually, in previous authorities where this has been implemented, it's actually helped speed up the process uh, and have a better delivery methodology because there's one consistent approach going forward. Councillor Sumter, are you satisfied with the answer? Okay. Um, Mr Selgren, I believe you want to make a comment? Thank you, Chairman, if I might. And just, I'm, I'm pleased Councillor Sumter felt that uh, the Director's answer responded to that. I just, just would add to that by saying that um, what we have tried very, very hard to is keep the process simple and straightforward, and therefore we're hoping that that will mean that timely decisions are made, and I think um, the, the process that we, we looked at, that we showed you in the presentation, confirms that. The work and the last point that uh, the director made on the slide um, was that uh, we've got public intelligence working with us to provide that external challenge to make sure that our processes give this council sound governance and can ensure that members, when making decisions about property and assets, do so on, on firm ground with good governance and certainly good value for money, but equally well to do so in such a way that doesn't create uh, the bureaucracy that I think Councillor Somper may fear, but I will give her assurance that we are working very hard to keep that process effective, um, but simple and straightforward. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. Can I just ask, um, on page 34, 2.2, .2, you talk about um, unrealistic timescales the 2.5 through to 
It is intended to deliver a revised strategy asset management plan by May 2023. And just wondering, is there sufficient officer resource to make this achievable and deliver the strategy on the time given? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, we are comfortable to say as part of that increase in resources, as part of that business partnering arrangement, that particular individual is getting new resources to actually deliver that program. We have an internal working group board that meet on a fortnightly basis against a program of activity and targets. Uh, and I am comfortable at this time, we are on track to meet the uh, uh, anticipated date of 2023. A um, couple of points, really. Um, did I hear you say, Peter, that you don't have a 100% handle on all our assets? That is true. In terms of 100%, no, we don't. We are still finding new ownerships and liabilities that come forward almost on a, I'm not saying a daily basis. It is much better than where it was nine months ago. Uh, the team have had a refocus in the last nine months to get to the bottom of the data. Um, I know that may sound odd, but even central government would tell you they are not completely 100% sure. I've never yet worked in an authority where 100% has been known to be accurate because we're always buying, selling, moving, leasing, and licensing. So at any one point in time, there is always a movement to the core bottom database of assets. So you'll never get to 100% at a snapshot in time. Councillor Gorge, you want to come back? I appreciate the fact that you've only been with the, the council since January. But I do find that after three and a half years with all the assets that we don't know exactly what we do have, which is costing us, obviously costing us money. We've got money sitting, sitting around that is dormant. Mr. Mr. Hopkins, I'm aware that um, Mr. Selgren wants to come in and speak. I don't know which one wants to go first. Mr. Selgren. General, I think it's a good question that Council Gorringe uh, raises, but let me just put that into, into context before Mr Hopkins adds to, to the comments. So I think it's in the context of a half billion pound uh, asset base. Um, that figure is to do with, and, and I think the Director will explain in a little bit more detail, the amount of information we have. The, other, the third observation is, of course, that members will know we've converged a very large property estate from the predecessor councils, um, and some of those things that we are now finally getting to the bottom of, of, of being clear about and having detailed information on relates to that convergence process. So I think there is, there is, a, um, there is an explanation of the point that, that, that Mr Hopkins has raised, but I'm sure he'll add a little bit more information to that context. But I think members need to be aware of the context. We, we've, we've been converging from predecessor councils. It is a very, very large S estate that we're looking uh, after, and those that we are still getting to the bottom of are relatively small in number, and I think Mr Hopkins will confirm um, we do have some information on those, but it's about having the depth of information that allows us to know that we're operating or holding that estate in the most uh, value for money way. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, executive director has covered that point really, really well in terms of that knowledge. And it's like we are talking about a minimal percentage now where we're trying to find exactly what we don't we don't know what we don't know is the best way of putting it um we can only rely upon the evidence of the data that was transferred at the lgr process and as i've already said in some cases that was just simply a spreadsheet of information that was it and therefore in terms of that time of finding out uh you know in terms of pockets of land the, the caveat i would say they're not necessarily costing us money i'm not talking about the bigger buildings here that are occupied and used these are pockets of land that may be sitting at the edge of highway verges but not being adopted by highways and sitting them with us you know pavements and footpaths etc so these are not actual buildings being occupied i am confident we we know what we know on that basis but these are those periphery assets that a council of this size would have on its books that we as part of the asset and property review of putting that team in together to be able to rationalise and then say what can we actually move away from. Councillor Gorringe, you wish to come back? So w w will you, when you've got this all together, will you be in a situation where you would, any, any properties that you may not want that are perhaps re rel relatively small, like perhaps um, things like toilets, for instance, will you be offering those to parish and town councils? Mr. Selgren? Draw a careful definitional distinction here. So um, the 
Corporate Director's response to Councillor Gorringer's question about the assets, he's, 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 he was very clear in saying that those bits we are still seeking to get to the bottom of a result of convergence relate to residual pieces of land, not to properties. So if I can now address uh, my response to, to Councillor Gorringer's question about um, assets, and, and the, in a sense I think he's referring to the smaller assets, uh, members will be aware that Cabinet did approve a system for asset transfer to Town and Parish Council, indeed other uh, community-based organisations, and there is a, is a process in place that is accessible through the Council's website that those organisations can express an interest, and we have a procedure uh, that we can go through to assess uh, those proposals and, and move them forward. Uh, Mr Hopkins may wish to say a little bit more about the detail of that. Mr Hopkins, did you wish to come up further? Thank you. Councillor Curran, are you satisfied with the answer? <laughs> One more question, which is actually a Pacific. Um, <clears throat> I was a, uh, a member of East Dorset Council and our offices at Furs Hill. We put them up for sale before we actually became a unitary. And here we are, three and a half years later, and we still haven't sold it. And it's five, five million plus money just laying there doing nothing. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> okay, give me an update. What's happening then? Can I can I just, can we go through the chair, please? Um, and I am mindful as to whether we're going to stray into any grounds that are, are, are sensitive in terms of in terms of commercial. Thank you, thank you. Um, Councillor Perry, portfolio holder, you, you wish to speak, I'm, I'm happy to indulge you. Thank you, Chair. It was just picking up on something that uh, Councillor Gorringe had uh, referred to, which is, of course, the assets of former, uh, particularly county council authority, and in my own portfolio, mindful of those have been youth and community club buildings, many of which would agree to be transferred to charitable bodies or town and parish councils. I uh, understand in many cases sufficient work was carried out for that to happen, but at tenancy at will agreements, when many of these bodies were seeking to have rather more assured tenancies. I just wonder how we uh, progress on these matters, because it has been raised me a number of times by the charitable groups that operate them, that they still feel they would like to see additional assurances around their lease agreements. Okay, Mr. Hopkins. Uh, sorry, Mr. Hopkins. I think it was a demotion, I think. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Parrott. Uh, as part of that resource element, the estates function who undertake that uh, have had uh, are, are completely under-resourced at this point in time uh, due to a combination of staff leaving and unable to fill those specialist technical posts coming forward. Um, as part of the uh, upcrease and in-lift in resources, we have now to bring in some temporary resources uh, who are dealing with that base. Uh, however, they are focusing at this point in time on existing revenue income streams coming in and you know, debt collection that still needs to happen uh, but it's part of the changes in the implementation of new resources that team is being bolstered but we are struggling to find the right technical people who can take up posts to actually come and do those tendencies at Wales because they are sitting there on the list of needing to be done don't recognize any doing it's just the prioritization of actually focusing on the getting the money through the door for us at this point in time you're satisfied with the answer Councillor Perry yeah, I think the only thing I would come back is that we would want to understand uh, in any revised timescale where those tenancy will agreements could be, um, you know, progress forward because obviously we don't want them to sit in for, you know, forever and a day in an in-tray somewhere. We do need to find some way of resolving those. I'm happy, uh, Chair and Councillor Parry, to, to go away and take that specific question away. And perhaps if we can identify and be clear that we are working to the same list, then we can put a programme of activity together to come back to you in terms of a timetable to help you know, give some comfort that we are on, on working our way through that list. Thank you. I did raise earlier about having a sufficient officer corps to do this work. OK, could I just ask... Um, it was a bit disappointing that SWAP came in and highlighted some of the issues um, surrounding um, about how we were actually putting this, this plan together. Um, 
we were led to believe that the strategic asset management um, asset management plan team were working in conjunction with the climate, ecology, and emergency team. They were working hand in hand, but that didn't seem to be taking place. Can we have an assurance now that that's that that is a more joined up thinking approach now? Thank you, Chair, uh, for the question. There, there's a legacy issue here of actually how the authority has been improving capital projects in isolation of that wider piece before the corporate landlord model is there. And that comes back to putting in that place, that governance, to make sure that we are then achieving that climate ecology emergency. So my team are working very closely now with the corporate director uh, in that area to ensure that actually we bed as part of that governance an assessment around actually what does the impact of that capital program have around our target of becoming as a council, carbon neutral by 2014 as a county by 2050. Uh, but again, the legacy issue has been we're now working with a large range of capital projects where none of that base work has been undertaken. So we are definitely working more closely together. We're looking at some joint assessment tools together. Uh, but again, everything else, that takes a little bit of time to bed in around the, the corporate governance. I should, from a, from a transparency point of view, given understanding that this, this is a legacy, as you say, that before you join the authority, just, just to make that clear, thank you. Um, Mr Selgren. Thank you, Chairman. Just, just a sense for the record, just to clarify that the audit was a piece of audit work, as is not uncommon, that we, we commissioned. So this is not audit coming in, having concerns having been raised or whistleblowing or whatever. This, this was the director coming in, evaluating the situation and feeling it was appropriate to ask the audit to provide uh, an independent, rigorous review of the current situation to ensure that this council's procedures and policies were on a sound and robust footing. Yes, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Bryan. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think it's worthwhile mentioning that when we secured £18 million from the government with some very tight deadlines on delivering, all of that responsibility fell onto property and assets. And they really had to look at that as a priority, otherwise the money had to go back. And I think uh, uh, whilst we're looking at the negatives um, quite often, um, this is a big positive, the way the team performed. And I'd just like to highlight it so that people don't get the impression, especially the general public, uh, that we have a, a, a difficulty. Um, the only difficulty we have is we're quite successful in getting money uh, from government, but they do stick some very tight deadlines on it. And it's a case of what do we drop first to actually make this happen? So I just thought I'd highlight that for, uh, uh, for members. Thank you, Councillor Brown, for your contribution. As you, you, you're aware that I do know about those tight deadlines. Um, thank you. Um, Councillor Andrews. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation, Peter. Uh, very good. Um, but um, some of my questions have been answered about resource and climate working together, etc. But um, on a similar vein to what Councillor Somper said, um, well, I just wonder if we've identified the ten as highest value assets and we've got a project plan behind those assets, uh, or, or what we're going to do with opportunities for those assets in, in the future. Um, I've got another question to follow up, but if you can have a word with that one. Mr Hopkins. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, we actually have a top list of 20, uh, but again, it's cutting that list in terms of its operational requirements. As you'd imagine, you know, County Hall sits in that list, but again, that's a building we do need to operate and maintain from. But in terms of other corporate portfolios, yes, we're working through that. That's part of that external review. And then our other top list of what I would call commercial non-operational activities, i.e. some of the, the, the farms or some other of our buildings and business estates, that's the work Montague Evans are looking at to go, how do we maximise and extract the value for this organisation from that list? Councillor okay, Andrews. Yep, thank you. Um, my second question, or the one I've got left now, um, is... Um, Consultation with local members when a big asset is going to be um, disposed of. I know we had a little bit of a problem, might have been before your time, uh, on Southwark's house uh, because none of the Dorchester members were, were uh, consulted properly anyway. Um, so I'm just wondering if that, uh, along with Councillor Garange's um, uh, asset that he's got down in his ward, um, whether that's, uh, if something is going to be disposed of there, whether local consultation with local members will take place. Hopkins. Uh, Mr. Selgren. 
Chairman, well, if I respond in the first instance on the on the South Walks to Councillor Andrews' question, I'm, I'm sorry again. I'm going to have to just sort of uh, just gently push back. Um, there was actually quite a lot of involvement with members on on the South Walks decision, part, part, partly because um, I think what we're all aware of is that the the council is bound statutorily to to ensure that it gets best value for money in terms of, of of the assets, and of course that is always our primary consideration. But clearly, when the council is doing those things, it's mindful of its wider responsibility, social value, uh, economic regeneration, uh, its obligations for housing, and so on. So when we would consider something like that, we have to statutorily meet the requirement to achieve best value. But as a council, we will always seek to see if we can get greater value out of it, particularly in terms of the wider social and economic uh, benefit. And I think in relation to um, what's happened with South Walks House, that's a very good uh, example. As you know, one of the proposals that came forward quite early on, which would have given the council an extremely good uh, financial uh, uh, return from the proposal, was in relation to housing. There was a very strong feeling from local members, uh, and indeed from the local community in Dorchester, that actually, whilst housing would provide some advantage, um, having, um, uh, having an office space use was preferable because of the, the spend of those office workers in, in the town centre and therefore the, benefit, the wider benefit to the, door, to the Dorchester and also the wider Dorset economy. So it's those sorts of things that we are, we are constantly bal balancing and members have, uh, yeah, the portfolio holders having to consider in making those decisions. Um, and I would cite actually the outcome of South Walks House of being a good example where the feedback from the local community, in particular the role played by the local members in making those points about if the council can ensure that there is a wider economic benefit from the ongoing use of South Walks House did have a significant bearing on that decision, but mindful, as I've explained, that at the end of the day, we legally need to meet that requirement to achieve the best uh, financial deal that we can. But I say in that case, a good example of a win-win because we've got a, we, we've got a good sound financial arrangement uh, with a tenant, of course, who's a public sector tenant, and we are seeing those, uh, those public sector workers continue to uh, use uh, the facilities in the town centre as, as the council employees did in previous years. I hope that's helpful, Chair. Because I may not have answered Councillor Andrews' final actual question, so um, do, just might want to... Oh, the future. If, uh, so you might want to ask uh, Mr Hopkins if he'd, if he'd pick up on, on what we're going to do in relation to sites moving forward around uh, uh, member and community engagement. Mr Hopkins, I've got a question on this myself, but carry on. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I think I mentioned during the presentation um, very much around making sure we engage with local members. Uh, the challenge is always finding at the right moment, should we say, because there's sometimes quite a lot of options, praises work, working around at a very low level, but actually so once we think we know what, actually what the right solution is, then coming and having that conversation to help us inform and direct the steer around that particular asset or that piece of land in terms of yeah, is it a community asset transfer for a play park or actually is it a big enough plot for two houses? So we need to come back and have that conversation. But I've been very clear with the team that's, that's, that's embedded in the detailed process. So we say rather than the, the flow chart you saw, which is the overarching just governance, um, it's, it's a very active area that I'm keen to make sure we do engage with, with members on a regular basis in, and say my door is always open open if members want to come and have a conversation about assets in their in their ward. Before I come back to you, Councillor Andrews, um, picking up on the point that you've raised, um, I was somewhat surprised to read, and I'm not going to get parochial about this, so I won't name the asset, but both yourself and Mr Selgren visited the asset with me in my ward, and I was somewhat surprised to see it within the report, um, current surplus freehold and leasehold assets that have been identified for disposal termination to be completed between March and June 20, 2021. Um, and it, it, there was a, it says it's ongoing, and I said that asset actually appears within that grouping, but I have no knowledge of, the, of either a um, disposal of it or a termination of the, of the long lease that it's got. And I'm not, as I say, I don't want you to get parochial about it, but your door is always open, so I'm going to come and have a conversation with you outside this meeting, <laughs> Ms. Tompkins. Okay, thank you. Councillor Andrews. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and, and that was half the problem. I know that the consultation with local members happened. But it was when it started, uh, and that was after rumours had started to get out. So it's got to be very, very careful. Um, but uh, there were some upset people. But I will applaud all the actions on item 10, which is South Hall House, which is one of them, uh, that you've done to reduce our bill by a million pounds a year. So thank you very much. Councillor Canning. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, it was quite strikingly, John's actually covered a lot of the ground I was just going to raise, actually, as well. 
Um, but I think you're missing a trick. I think you missed a trick today by not making it a specific part of your presentation to, that members do need to be involved in this process. Because um, there's two factors. One, which we haven't mentioned yet. Sometimes the local members have knowledge of the community, of what's acceptable, or, or, or even who owns certain assets that might not otherwise be available. And I think if you don't tap into the, the, that local knowledge, you're, you're missing out on something that could be really helpful. And also, I have to say, as, as a member, and I'm sure John agrees with this, um, the, the worst thing that can happen to, to, to a councillor is, is to be buttonholed by some member of the public saying, so-and-so is happening, what do you know about it? And you don't know anything about it at all. Um, and yet members of the public do seem to get hold of information, however, however we can't be certain how they do it, but they do, and it can be really embarrassing when you're put on the spot and don't know what, what's going on. So I would say, I think it's important to emphasise that, that members are involved at an early stage um, when dealing with disposal of assets and on future changes. Uh, I'm sure we can all agree that that, that has to be confidential, that, that they have to respect the, uh, the importance of, of that from the council's commercial point of view and all the rest of it. But really it's a waste of the, the talents of, of members if you're not using what's there as, as, as a free asset and a free way of communicating to the community. Thank you, Councillor Canning. And obviously board members' knowledge within their own areas mm. as well. Um, Mr. Selkren. Thank you, Chairman. And Councillor Cannon makes an extremely good point. And, and you'll know, I suppose, the observation I make, obviously, Mr. Hopkins has said his doors are open. Um, as you know, I make that offer to uh, walk, walk the ward walks, walk in the patches with you. Uh, often those are drives, in fact, in a, in a county like Dorset. Um, and that's very helpful because it's that, it's that two way street, because it, it, is, it is both ways. It's very helpful for us as officers also to have that local intelligence from you as members. So I think Councillor Kang does make an extremely good point because it's that the earlier we can start and, and the more regular base on which we can have that dialogue, the better. And if I may, Chairman, of course, you'll know from um, your own uh, um, ward that Mr. Hopkins and I have both been have done a walk with you to, to do exactly that. So that, that helpful feedback that you give us and, and the fact that we then know what the issues are for you locally, we can then make sure that we uh, keep you briefed on, on emergency situations locally, exactly the way that Councillor Canning describes, that their members don't get surprises and we can get an early heads up uh, about the views that you have and the views that your communities have about the best use of council assets. I hope that's helpful. And uh, just to reinforce, if I may, uh, and many members in this chamber know this, but the, the offer of, of a ward walk um, with myself or any member of the play senior team is always available. Just 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 contact us and we can set that up. Thank uh, you. Councillor Kenning? Yeah. I actually think it'd be very helpful if you could to produce a, a summary of what you've just been saying and email it to every member of the council, just reminding them that these the, are available, um, and how they're supposed to work, uh, uh, because I'm sure we're all we're sitting here today and you're, you're telling us, but the people who aren't here today wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily know about this or appreciate what, what's, what's available. Thank you, Sagan. I was thinking actually your email box is going to be very full over the next week. Um, thank you. If I can then move to, I've got a couple of questions here, I'm gonna, and I'm going to wrap them up together. Um, we talked in the report at page 40, the report is excellent, um, concerning about service property strategies. And it's are you getting buy-in from the services? Is this an achievable time frame? Um, it's going to be dependent on the different services actually talking to one another, communicating with one another, and giving you the necessary information you need. So are the directives working together to deliver the plan? Is intercommunication in the council authority of a standard that we should expect? And will it help to deliver a successful model and outcome? Thank you, Chair, for the, for the question. Um, and it does come back to that point of understanding and doing that option appraisal and actually say working with the services about their future operating model and understanding actually where the, where the assets are in the right place to serve our residents. Um, and actually for that disposal, we, we do have a list of disposals uh, that need to be already, that's been agreed and that, that need to be focused and pushed out the door to, to, to generate those, those capitals coming back in. But we always need to keep that pipeline going. But it is always at that case of demonstrating 
we are here to deliver the frontline services for residents as instructed by the council uh, and our job is then to do those options appraisals to make sure actually we're integrating and understanding what the opportunity cost is to do something in perhaps in a different way um, hence why those business partners are looking to be introduced from a property point of view to work with our services more closely and become embedded to actually work through those list of frontline buildings at the moment and go okay so what what can we do to help release future value from the estate thank you Mr. Hopkins so it's it's a, and it's a, it's it's a question to ask and it's a difficult one to answer, I appreciate, but what I'm trying to get down to is the fact is that those assets that are pertaining to children's services, those assets that are pertaining to adult services, those that are in place, um, those that legal have some um, input into in achieving this plan, are all of those different bodies actually talking to one another and communicating to your satisfaction, your team's satisfaction, in order to expedite this plan at the pace it needs to be done? We can always do better. Uh, and again, it comes back to the capacity across not just us, it's how uh, those services already have a day job to do, if that makes sense. So you know, it doesn't necessarily always help when some of my staff are knocking on the door going, so what are you doing with that? What, what, what's your plan? What's your future? So again, it is just not just a resourcing in my area, it's obviously the upskilling and understanding across the piece to engage with our colleagues across the council and understanding what what we're trying to do is a, at the, the behind the scenes with the asset to help them drive their future solution and what do they need? Uh, do we actually physically need buildings? Residents need some, we have to visit what is the future model of how they are looking to deliver those services? So we've got that early horizon scanning opportunity to go, okay, so actually in five years time, your new operating model might mean you don't need to be in X location. What do we do with it? So we're, we're working. It is a new way for this council to operate uh, and it's balancing that strategic need behind the scenes with the with the operation really on a day-to-day -day basis to still continue to manage and deliver services to residents there is always room for improvement thank you Mr. Hawkins. so i'll take it from that then that the it's effectively the the executive directors then with the levels of management tiers underneath them need to be keeping the pressure on to make sure those communications are taking place within the council authority so that we can actually deliver this as i say within the time frames needed with an officer resource that I've always said, we are under-resourced in terms of the officer court. I still believe that. I believe that from day one. I believe that in the joint committee, as some of you are already aware, and I still believe it is the case. Um, so shall I leave that there then, as we take that away as a point that it has to be driven by those executive directors to make sure all their underlying tiers of management are actually on the ball and actually giving you the, your team the information that they need. Thank you. Sorry, if I move to my next question. Um, so, at 22, page 45, um, there some, there's, there's a couple of dates within there, but when we go through the report, o overall the, the dates don't exist within, within the document on the actual lines. Um, the plan doesn't have delivery or completion dates on, on a lot of it. It stuff says stuff is ongoing. Um, would it be helpful over an extended time frame to enable scrutiny to monitor performance in the future if those dates are in there? And also, um, what I would like to see within the report in the future, I say it's a really good report, but I'd like to see a RAG system. I'd like to see a, a red, amber, green. At the moment, we've got, we've got the report where we've got um, items in, in green, and then we've got in red that is ongoing and I think it would be beneficial to scrutiny as we, we keep on going through this report if we had a RAG rating on it so that scrutiny could actually in instantly get a, get a grip as has been used already in this or similar comment has already been used in this meeting this morning that we can um, have, a, have a good handle on um, what is at risk what is it in progress and in places likely to be achieved and what has been done is, is that a fair comment to make yes uh, happy to take those comments on board and adapt the paper uh, for next time round when we come back in with the RAG rating on it. I think it's a very, very fair point. Uh, and certainly with those target dates, so you can hold me to account. Mr. Selgren. Chairman, thank you. And certainly I'd, I'd endorse that. I mean, it's a very good suggestion. And of course, the point I'd make, and, and actually making it earlier yourself in, in the other response, is that, of course, we, 
um, uh, Mr. Hopkins and his team can work extremely hard, but of course we depend, as you indicated, on the, on the cooperation of the whole organisation to do some of these things. So I think having scrutiny as a critical friend, us mapping out what those timelines are, and in a sense you providing that critical uh, friend challenge will help the whole organisation make sure that we're moving all of those projects forward at, at, at pace and in, to the intended time scale, and also that you're able to identify those where um, the RAG status is, is, is raising a level of concern so that I hope you, through this regular process of receiving this report, can help course correct this council to make sure that we are uh, delivering those things that are the council's priorities. So I think this will be, Chairman, those two suggestions can only be a benefit and positive. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. Yeah. Okay. Um. Deputy Leader, Cabinet Member for Assets, Cabinet Member for, for Finance, and Cabinet Member for Corporation Transformation Change is the five key members on that board. In terms of the scrutiny element, um, in line with other directors, this is uh, we, we can feed in that process. There is nothing in those decisions or processes going through where we cannot put in a, a regular update to come back on the, where we are in terms of the structure, in terms of the processes and decisions being made, Chair. Uh, it, it, was, it wasn't, you're not deliberately being left out, let me put it that way. It's just a case in terms of other governance areas, we can feed that back into the process to make sure your committee's got visibility. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Mr. Silgren. Thank you, Chairman. Can I just, just, just add to that? So, obviously, at the, if you're looking on at Appendix 2 uh, on page 47, uh, so that, that shows the, the process of capital uh, decisions being made with, with decisions ultimately being made by uh, the Cabinet. Of course, this, your scrutiny committee will, look, will review those decisions afterwards to make sure that the original intent, intention around the implementation has, in fact, been followed through and the objectives achieved. So, there's, there's clear role for scrutiny following a cabinet decision, as, as we, we know well. I think the other one for me goes back to the report we're looking at uh, in the committee this morning, that uh, you have requested to have a regular update on the uh, strategy and uh, the property and assets work. And therefore, I think that is also the route through which you uh, have an input from scrutiny, to, as I said a moment ago, to provide that critical friend challenge to make sure the council is keeping on track in terms of its overall objectives to deliver the strategy. Thank you. So, if I can just move to, we talked in the report about that office, officer to desk ratio, and I'm also mindful of the fact that the car park seems to be extremely full, but the offices don't seem to be very full, it's a bit, it's a bit of a mystery to me as well. Um, I just wondered what that current officer to desk ratio was now, I know we've talked in the past about a, a 5 to 1, a 6 to 1, a 7 to 1, I'm not sure exactly where we are now, what the thinking is around it. Um, I appreciate, Mr Hopkins, that I've, I've, I've argued this point long before you come to this council authority. I have a concern about those officers to desk ratios. I think it stores up a problem for the council long term in expecting officers to work from home in houses that we know na internationally were criticised for the, for the size of houses that we build in this country. Often those officers will be working from dining room tables, from kitchen tables, back bedrooms. It's not a good and conducive workplace. It's going to store up problems, I believe, in the future in terms of stress management over our officer corps and possible relationship breakdowns within their own private and domestic lives. So I've got a real concern about the officer death ratio. And once we get rid of officers, whether we repurpose them or dispose of them, it's going to be very difficult in the current climate of local government finance to bring those officers back into play again. So I just wondered what the thoughts, what the latest thoughts on it were and what those ratios are, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we are working to the uh, a, a 10 to 2 ratio. However, as you can see by the building current use, that that's not uh, actually being utilised. There is more desks and space available for those staff. The organisation is clear in terms of its hybrid working capability and it's for teams to work through with their senior leaders and managers what is the need for staff to come into buildings. At this point in time, we are not seeing any pressure against existing workforces uh, need to have desks and spaces. Uh, what we are seeing a demand for is more can work with you to understand actually what that could look like from the cross council but for me it's finding the right balance of what teams need to have desks on a regular basis and with locations how do we generate the hybrid space for the flexi work or the touchdown space so they can come and go with the peripatetic workers who've always got what they need and then that collaboration space so actually where we can do the thinking the brainstorming to develop how we deliver services 
Thank you, Mr. Tompkins, and I hope you appreciate that it's my concerns about potential problems in the future for this council authority surrounding that death ratio and expecting officers to work from home isn't going to happen today or tomorrow. It's two, three years from now when I think we will we, we will start to see realistically those problems coming through. It's a personal opinion, but that's, that's how I feel. Mr. Selgren. Thank you, Chairman. It's just to, to offer the, the, other, the other side of the, uh, the return to the office equation. This is something that all organisations are grappling with post-pandemic. Uh, but, of course, many were starting to think about before the, the pandemic arose. So what, what the pandemic, of course, enforced was a requirement for uh, home, flexible and agile working. So where we're at, of course, is that a very significant number of office-based, well, all of our office-based staff are now able to work flexible and agile. And I think this council is facing exactly the same challenges that many other organisations are. What does that mean? What, because I've been, been reading some um, around this recently as part of a course that I'm currently doing, um, the, the issue is largely a people one. So the experts we're talking about are saying the, the thing to get, get a focus on is recognising that the office is a resource to the staff and therefore how do we make an offer in terms of the working environment that enables staff to do their jobs effectively rather than, say, rather than looking at this from a starting point from the property end of the telescope. And again, in-house, uh, Mr Dunn is currently leading a piece of work called the Dorset Workplace, as many members will know, and that is exactly how we're, we're approaching it. We're looking at this in terms of how do we best meet and how do we best support our staff to do the job that we're asking them to do with a whole series of resources, one of which happens to be a physical office space. Um, what I might suggest, Chairman, um, if you would like to, to consider it as a committee, given that I do strongly believe this is a challenge that virtually any organisation you could name is currently facing, the committee might wish to consider doing a very focused piece of task and finished work to perhaps bring in some best practice uh, from other places, because I say this is, this is not just us that's facing this challenge, and perhaps to help the council on that journey to how do we as an organisation respond to the new, more agile way of working. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. Yes, that, that was very helpful, because. You've, you've almost got ahead of me because I'm, I'm, I'm presuming that we are actually talking to other council authorities that are in the same position as, imagine all local government authorities up and down the country, just about everyone I should think is in the same position, and are those conversations going on in the background to see how they're working with the problems that they face concerning with this office death ratio, the cost of keeping offices open, and where those offices are going to be working from. So I think, I think that would be a really good piece of work to bring to the committee. If you might indulge me, Chairman, the other one I would observe, and I've, I've held this view long before the pandemic, by the way, actually elected members of the, are, a, are a quintessential example of agile workers. You as, you as elected council have always done that. You, you work from home, you, you do work within your, um, within your wards, you come into the council premises to hold meetings or to meet with officers or, or others. So I also think that in terms of what the council could take moving forward to how we approach this in terms of our staff, some of the experience of members of having to work in that flexible, agile way might well inform and help that process. So again, I would perhaps uh, support your suggestion that if you, if you would like to, a piece of task and finish work could actually add a lot of value to this organisation right now. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. I won't mention about meetings in pubs then. Councillor Canning. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, your chairman's question is much more on the long term, but my, my question is much more on the short term. Um, so far, we've had a remarkably mild year temperature-wise, but obviously people are all very aware of the costs of, of fuel and, and what they, well, if they're working from home, what their fuel bills might be if they're running the central heating uh, during a really cold period. So my question is much more, do we have the capacity? I, mean, I know we have some capacity, but how much capacity do we actually have? If there was a sudden large movement from our staff to all want to come in here simply because they want to save a bit of money on their on their fuel bills uh, and how capable and set up are we to deal with that because it could happen very quickly the weather could change very very you know very quickly uh, so welcome your thoughts on that jim again that's a, a very helpful question actually um throughout the pandemic we made clear to staff that if they needed for whatever reason to have an office space, they would have access off to that office space. We obviously did that in a COVID secure way. Uh, and generally, I'm, I'm proud of what the council achieved. So there will be colleagues who for personal preference reasons or anything else want from time to time to work in office or indeed to do so regularly. We'd have staff who worked throughout uh, the pandemic uh, in, in the office space. 
moving forward, you're right about the challenge, and, and we, and again, it's why the piece of work that the chairman discussed might might well be timely and helpful. Is that is that balance? Because of course, while staff might uh, find it helpful to come into the office to save on domestic heating costs, equally, well, many of them have to have made some journey to get here. So it's going to be that for each individual, it's going to be that economic choice about the cost of the travel involved versus the heating of the home environment. There is some, and, and Mr. Dunn might be able to say a little bit more about this. There are some, uh, although the tax regime doesn't help us, but there are some things that we can help staff with around some of those issues. I've noted that the government was very generous about uh, tax breaks during the during the COVID period to assist with some of that. Clearly, those have now been withdrawn for reasons that obviously I suspect relate to the national economic uh, situation. But again, I think getting behind some of those issues could, would be really, really helpful. Certainly the leadership team here remains committed that staff who wish to use office space will be able to do that. And the piece of work that Mr Hopkins was referring to is to get that balance right. We need to understand what we think the demand is like to be, and then we can make provision in order to meet that, that need. But our, our focus is to put the needs of our staff first. We need to provide the best possible facilities that we can in whatever way, be they fixed office location or f uh, flexible working or whatever, that is what comes first because we've got to provide our staff with the right tools to do the job. Once we've done that, then we can look at how we, how we deliver it and the requirements that we have. But certainly that's the approach we're taking on the, on the office side. So it's, it's in a sense demand led, recognising we're supporting staff appropriately and then we can, we can flex resources accordingly. And then obviously, I guess the second part of your question is, making sure that where we don't need office space that we can uh, decommission or multiple that to, to save the council's energy and, and some of the costs. Okay, so can you come back? Yes. I, mean, I, mean, I guess the, the, the winter's going to be the test, isn't it? In the sense that if we run through the winter and we still have spare capacity all the way through the winter, then the probably chances are that permanently is, isn't required. But I am concerned that people might you know, very much in a very quick fashion, just make individual decisions that result in them all coming to the office all at the same time in similar circumstances. And I mean, how much spare capacity do we have in that situation, really? I mean, it's, it's, I mean in theory, it's great to say we, we represent the, our staff to have, have their own choices, but there's got to be a, a maximum limit, presumably. If they all turned up at once, you, you would have a problem. Mr. Selgren. As ever, Councillor Kenning is fingered the exact uh, issue that we are currently addressing our minds to. So it's just that. So um, what we are finding, what we're encouraging teams to do, is to look at that on a team-by-team -team basis. So we're saying, you know, there is a resource, and, and the point that Councillor Canning makes, that clearly if everybody came in on, on one day, it would, it would create a peak of demand. We're actually we're trying to sort of spread the load across the, the office estate and the, and the resource. So far, that appears to be working quite well. Um, what we're seeing in this council, not uh, untypical to what I've seen in, in other places, other organisations, um, there is a great propensity to work from home from, from Friday, and that, that is just how it is. I think a lot of people use Friday to sort of catch up on routine work, and that's probably better done in a quiet space than it, than it is in, a, in an office. Uh, but in terms of other things, we're leaving that, that decision with teams because, it's, again, it's important from a... Um, to follow the, the council's values that we allow this process, we allow teams and, and staff and managers to take decisions around those sorts of things. So certainly in terms of the team we've in place, we're making it very clear that we, we need you to spread. So we, we're saying there is, a, there is a resource available. And we need you to spread that demand in such a way that it doesn't mean we have the peak that, that you described in, in your question. Um, so far, that appears to be working quite well. And, and our, our colleagues are understanding that if everybody asked to have a meeting on on Monday, for example, that, that isn't going to work. But if we allow that or encourage that demand to be spread across the working week, then we actually what we can do is get that optimum balance where Mr Hopkins can achieve that desk ratio that we've talked about, which is efficient in terms of use of asset. But also what we're actually doing is supporting teams to deliver the work they need to, to deliver, which, of course, as I've said, uh, will always come first. I, I hope that helps, Jim. That's right. Thank you. Um, I've got... Um Councillor Carr Jones, who's joining us virtually, who wished to ask a question, I believe. I do. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for allowing me in. Uh, I was really looking forward to this um, meeting and somehow managed to get cut off just as uh, Pete Hopkins' presentation started. So it's somewhat frustrating. Um, Pete mentioned um, the management group with the various cabinet members 
who are party to that. What I'd like to ask is whether he could find some, whether he'd find it useful, and I know I would find it useful, to, as portfolio holder for housing, be part of that management group. Thank you, Chair. Mr Sogren. Thank you. And, and for Councillor uh, Carl Jones and, and, and other members. So as, as Mr Hopkins said in, in response to the earlier question, um, the exact terms of reference of the Asset Strategy Board are still under discussion. I know that Cabinet members have been discussing in, in the matter of the past few weeks uh, the exact terms. So I think perhaps what, Council, what I might advise Councillor Carl Jones is perhaps he wants to uh, continue those discussions uh, with his Cabinet colleagues and, and officers are advising on perhaps the optimum uh, um, membership of that particular group. Thank you. So, Councillor Guy Jones, I understand that, that you can continue those conversations outside of this meeting. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Okay, if I move to my next uh, speaker, Councillor Took. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've spent probably the last 10 years of my working life before I retired and became a councillor working from home. Um, so I know a lot about it. I've done it a long time. Um, it works so long as you get meetings with the rest of your team on a regular basis. You, it, it doesn't work if you're constantly in an isolated position. So it's important that people do meet together. That doesn't mean that one person comes into the office one day and the next person. You need to have team sessions where you get together, on a, not necessarily weekly, but on a reasonably regular, frequent basis to make it work. The other concern I have is in order to do remote working, you need a decent broadband connection. Uh, I'm lucky, I, I've, I've had that for, for many years. I've been in the IT industry most of my life, so I've, I've been fairly switched on with IT. But Dorset being Dorset, and it's a lovely place, and I'm glad I moved down here half a lifetime ago, um, it doesn't have brilliant broadband everywhere for some odd reason, I've, I've noticed this. Um, in order to get decent broadband, people may need to invest in, in full fiber, get higher package broadbands, uh, if they can get online at all. Does the council offer any assistance to people with those additional costs um, in order to help them work from home? Thank you. Mr. Selgren. Thank you. Again, really, really good set of uh, questions. So let me just pick up in, in relation to meetings so that the same applies. Same as we said about the, the desk, we said if, if teams need meeting rooms to have team meetings, then um, those will be available and indeed, indeed are. Uh, again, I think the point is well made. Certainly, I, I can comment in, in relation to place, and I think this is replicated across the council, but we've been very clear that we do expect teams to meet regularly. That's, that's a, just a good practice to share things, manage to give it some direction, talk about the wider things that are going on, to receive uh, feedback. And we certainly recognise that whilst it won't always be possible, there is a preference for some of that to be done face-to-face -face because you can just gain so much more from a face-to-face -face meeting than you can um, by meeting virtually. What we've, what we've said is we'd, we'd, we're deliberately following that same philosophy and not mandating a particular way of doing it. What we are doing is giving strong encouragement to do that. And certainly in place, we, we give great uh, emphasis to the importance of team meeting. And, and, and again, if... Uh, um, the Corporate Director for Economic Growth and Infrastructure here, of course, who has planning within his uh, uh, um, range of functions, would be talking at length about the, the work particularly done with planning colleagues, who are another good example of, of, uh, of people who need to have an office space to work, to collaborate, as, uh, as, as has been suggested, um, have a quiet space to work, because when they write reports, they prefer to work from home in a quiet space to do that. And then obviously a lot of planners involved in, in going out onto site to see things. So they're a very good example. We, so we've been using in place the planning team to help really drive that forward. But the notion that we would, uh, we've got a, we've got a, um, we recognize the importance of team meetings is, is, is very much in, in, in the core thinking of, of what we do. In relation to broadband, so um, members will be aware this council got itself to the front of the queue with the National uh, Project Gigabit funding, and in fact the first part of that is rolling out. Uh, government has made a commitment to 100% rollout of, uh, of broadband, and indeed we have been lobbying hard as a council to make sure that happens. The economic reality is, and we've talked at length to the industry about this, who are very, very candid about the matter, the reality is that broadband is being rolled out as a commercial activity. What government is seeking to do is provide a level of support, subsidy and encouragement to that 
but at the end of the day, this is a market-led process. So what we're seeing in Dorset, and it's not uh, untypical for other uh, shire counties of our type, is that getting to the last two or three percent of broadband connectivity of premises, uh, so the last two or three percent of premises that are broadband connected is really difficult because the reality is that the economics of this don't work for the providers. And we've had the chief executive of um, what is now uh, um, uh, OpenReach in to talk to us. In fact, we had a series of meetings with her in which she was very candid about that. Now, one of the ways that that is addressed is government has in place a voucher scheme and our digital sit team are at the vanguard of this nationally and regarded by the Department uh, for um, Culture, Media and Sport as, 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 as being in the lead. Vouchers are something that can be given to people who don't have broadband connectivity. The purpose of that is to encourage enough people within a locality to use their voucher, which will encourage them, which will bring the market to their location. Um, it's certainly having an impact. Whether it will get all the way to 100% connectivity, I'm not entirely sure. And just to reassure members, if I had an email in from Chris Loder, and there's no one of our uh, local MPs uh, who was speaking to the DCMS minister on Tuesday of this week um, about that very issue. How in Dorset do we get to that last 2 or 3% of people where it's going to be very, very difficult through market forces for those locations to become connected? Um, internally, we don't, I, I, again, Mr. Donald, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think I'm right in saying we don't offer uh, any direct um, uh, subsidy to our staff around broadband connectivity, but certainly what we do do through the Digital Dorset team is to uh, ensure they're aware of and seek to as access the voucher scheme if that's something that might help their own domestic broadband connectivity. I, again, I hope that's, that's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. Before I come back to Councillor Took, I believe the Executive Director for Corporate Development wishes to speak, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you. Yes, I'll just give a quick perspective from the Corporate Services uh, or Corporate Development Directorate as well, because I think one of the one of the things that we learned as a senior leadership team through the pandemic or became really clear is it's very difficult for us to standardise as an organisation. So. My, my teams are predominantly desk-based, office-based, or were. John's team, as we've just heard, there's a number of office-based, but there's a lot also people out and about. You know, it's a place directorate sort of collecting waste or, you know, out and about. And in particular, the uh, people team, social care, are visiting uh, vulnerable people across Dorset, be they're adults or children, so they're not necessarily office-based. So when in the early days, we thought, should we make rules? But, but we've decided not to. And as John's described, for those that are office-based, we're very light touch and do what works for you uh, is our message. So for example, Dawn, who we'll be hearing from shortly, for Dawn's team, procurement team, they do need to get together regularly to exchange knowledge across the desk. So the whole team comes in on a Tuesday. Meanwhile, for, for that communications point, uh, every six weeks within corporate, Jonathan and I host a conference call, a video call. And so it was this morning, we had 260 colleagues all tuning in from across the country. So not all of our workforce are Dorset based. So even if it did get cold, they wouldn't necessarily want to sort of come into Dorset. We had sort of colleagues from Northamptonshire and, uh, and Southampton this morning on the call. So we make an effort to keep in touch. There's a different way of working. And then, in particular, tomorrow, the digital uh, and transformation team have got an away day. So the whole team is getting together for a whole day to do that bit of collaboration that they need to do uh, and so that they can work independently the rest of the time. In terms of the question about broadband and connectivity, during the pandemic, we did, for those staff that needed or wanted or had to work from home, we provided them with suitable equipment if they needed it, be that uh, an additional screen, uh, extra laptop, chair, anything they needed to, to make sure they were able to work effectively. We haven't offered broadband upgrades or any payment for broadband. And frankly, it, nobody has raised that matter with us. So in the early days of the pandemic, there was sort of various people were having connectivity problems. It was dropping out. But it all seems to be the way we work now. So um, so whether broadband... So it, I kind of give it from that perspective. Nobody has asked for support on broadband. And in the not spots and the, the, the low connectivity op uh, areas, as John's described, as a council, we're trying to raise that up because it's not just a, an issue for our residents, uh, for, for our staff. It's an issue for residents across the piece. Thanks. 
Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Councillor Took. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm slightly surprised nobody's raised it. I probably would have done. Um, but then again, um, I, I, and in terms of connectivity, uh, my grandson lives on a farm in North Yorkshire. He's saving his, his money from, from jobs. He's, he's 50. Uh, and he's uh, going to get a subscription to Skylink, which gives him satellite broadband, uh, which is an option that, that lots of people could, could explore because it gives you fairly quick, fairly uh, reliable access to broadband, regardless of where you are, uh, almost. If you're in the middle of a forest, it might be difficult. But it, it, it's a, so it, and this is the sort of thing that we should, we should be encouraging people to look at, I think, is to make sure they get the best possible connection, help them if possible, give them advice if we're not going to give them money. But we need people to get online, to get talking to their colleagues, to get working at speed, rather than, uh, I remember when it was a 1900 board modem and it whistled at me for 20 minutes before it connected. Um, we, we, we need to, to make sure that people can work properly from home. And that means making sure they've got the right broadband connection. Because without that, it becomes a nightmare. That, I'll leave that point there and I'm sure it's something that we can help people with. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Took. It's a point well made. And um, it, as, as Mr Dunn alluded to, it does not only impact our staff, it impacts the resident, residential population of Dorset, and particularly businesses as well, which will, it also helps to hinder our economy within Dorset. Um, just as a point of note, I am getting full fibre being brought to my town very shortly, as you said, Mr Selgren. Um, I'm not sure how my steam-powered computer is going to deal with it in Dorset, but we'll, we'll wait and see. But thank you, Councillor Took. It's a point well made. I've got a final um, point I wish to make, and it's just a comment really over the report, Ms. Hopkins, which as I've said is a really good report. Um, and it's um, to do with the public state on page 45, um, one public estate, 10A, um, I just, you know, it would, have been, it would have been interesting to see what made up that working group within the report and at, at like 10A and at 10B, 10C, there's insufficient information with no meat on the bones there. So in future, it would be, it would be helpful if that was expanded out. I don't expect to make a comment now unless you want to, but it was just, it was just, a, it was just a note from me. Thank you. Okay, members, I don't see anybody else wishing to speak. Um, we've seen the recommendations. Um, just an, is there any final comment from members of the committee? Does anybody wish to say anything else? No? Okay, so the recommendation that Scrutiny Committee review and comment upon progress in achieving the actions identified in the Property Strategy and Asset Management Plan, and that Scrutiny Committee notes the intention to develop a new Strategic Asset Management Plan. Um, and we've given this about an hour, I think. So are members content with those recommendations and to support them? Do you want me to get a proposal? Would you like to see if there's support for the task in front of you, Brad, and where can that be suggested? Yes, yeah, so... Um, as Mr. Selgren's suggestion, the task and finish group to look at the agile working and death, and death ratios. If members are, um, might add that to the recommendations as well, yes? Okay, thank you. Mr. Hopkins, thank you for that, and thank you for your report, and thank you for, for attending. It's been um, enlightening. Thank you. Good, good luck with the meeting that you will go to. Thank you. Okay, members, I'm going to move now off agenda to take in the statement from Councillor Bryant concerning car parks. Councillor Bryant. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, as requested by the Chair of Place and Resources uh, Scrutiny Committee, Parking Services had planned to provide a review on the impact of the changes to parking charges that were implemented in April 2022 to the Scrutiny Committee in November. In the last month, the strategic change in parking has been discussed and it's felt it would be more beneficial for the committee to await the decision of this change prior to receiving the report from Parking Services. Parking Services have been added to the Place and Resources Scrutiny Agenda for the start of 2023, at which point the decision regarding the strategic change will have been reached. This delay will enable parking services to give a more complete picture 
of the impact of the changes to parking services and future plans for the service in the report to scrutiny. I'd like to add that I will have at that time a more up-to-date position because I'm receiving weekly reports now on the position within the car park regarding machines because we have a considerable amount of failures. New machines are in the process of being ordered and Dawn can give you a better update than I can if you want that. Um, but the new machines will give us a lot more data to work from. Um, and it, I just feel that to come with something that is slightly incomplete is rather negative, whereas given the extra couple of months, we will have a very good and full report explaining the benefits and if, if there are any mistakes that we've made. So I just ask for the committee's uh, um, bearance on this as uh, I get the final report put together. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bryan. Um, I, I do appreciate the, the difficulties the team have had um, with taking on the, uh, the infrastructure from the, from the predecessor council, council authorities. Um, however, um, could I please impress on you and your team the extreme concern there is with residents in terms of those car park charges and those permit charges. There was always winners and losers, but the sheer scale of the increase in those car park permits for some residential populations across Dorset um, was, was, was really painful. And that's been exacerbated by the cost of living crisis we're presently going through and the fuel, fuel crisis we're going through at the moment. And um, if you could please take that away. Um, as you know, I, we are going to have a conversation outside of this meeting surrounding that, which I know we've been planning for some time now. Councillor Brown, you wish to come back? Yes, if I can just come back on that. That's partly the reason that we're asking for a bit of extra time, because we do need to look at it from a strategic point of view, because certain areas have suffered more than most, uh, or than others, should I say, not most. Uh, so it will enable me to have a full report to give to you um, uh, for the... Uh, uh, January, February meeting, whichever one we slide into. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Obviously, we're not going to debate this matter at the moment. Did anybody want to make a comment? Councillor Andrews? Yeah, my concerns around the machines and the amount of revenue we, we're losing at the moment through those machines not being there or, or renewed. And I know there's a supply issue with chips, etc. Um, but um, the sooner we can get to the grips of the, get to the bottom of this and get new machines in or get the current ones working probably the better, because we must be losing an awful lot of revenue. Thank you. Mr. Selgren, do you wish to make a comment? Is it just a... Sorry. I've just got a question on process for you, if I may, but members just want to complete the questioning to Councillor Brian first, but I would just like to come at the end and just, uh, I, I just identify something to you that I think just needs to be clarified. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not intended to debate it, um, Mr. Selgren, no. If you're happy to make a comment, yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Most grateful. Um, I think members are aware those that, that certainly sit on the committee and those that um, will have looked at the, the papers. There's an audit and governance meeting on Monday, where in, I think even in the finance paper there's reference to the car parking work. Uh, Councillor Brian and I discussed the matter earlier in the week, and uh, with your approval, um, would suggest that um, the implementation of the car park arrangements, some of the issues that this committee has previously discussed, it may be more appropriate for that discussion to be continued through this committee, given you've had, you have been involved in the decision and have looked at it from a scrutiny perspective. So I think uh, the point I want to raise to you, Chairman, is you may just wish to speak to the Chairman of Ordinate Governance to ensure this matter doesn't become double-handled. Yeah, uh, and again, it is in, in entirely your discretion, but certainly Councillor Brian and I feel that it might be better and more appropriate if the car park implementation were part of the scrutiny process, given this decision that's been implemented, um, clearly audit and governance will look at this from the point of view of, of just that, has, th has this been robust? But I think the detailed discussion of the, of, in a sense, the service issues might be better considered in this committee, but it, it is clearly chairman your determination. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. Yeah, at your suggestion, Councillor Canning and I will take it up with the chairman and vice chairman of audit and governance. Thank you. If I have no other comments on this, I'm going to move on. Councillor, 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 obviously I don't want to debate this item at this moment, but I'm happy for you to make a comment. I was just going to um, echo a little bit of what was said before in terms of the charge for car parking. I raised this earlier. Um, I live close to the Hampshire boundary, very close to New Forest District Council. 
Um, and their parking clock's giving me three hours parking. Um, I think cost me around 25 quid for the year, um, which compares with, what is it, a short stay shoppers of 78 pounds in Dorset. Um, the New Forest one doesn't give me access to all the car parks. It, it, none of the, it doesn't include the tourist type car parks, but it does the main shopping car parks. And it just seems an awful lot higher to, to shop in Dorset than it does in Hampshire, which is, for those of us on the margins, it doesn't make Dorset competitive. Uh, so I, I, I simply made that comment that, it, it, that I, I feel the car parking charges are higher in Dorset than, than, than perhaps would be ideal. But I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Took. Thank you, Councillor Bryan, for coming in and giving the, the statement today. And if you could take those comments away with you, please, to, for you and your team to consider. Thank you. I'm now going to move to agenda item eight, commercialisation and transformation programme. Um, the recommendation is that this report is seeking that Place and Resources Scrutiny Committee note the progress made in the proposed future developments under the programme and provide any considered view and to also consider whether there is a requirement for a further review of any elements of the programme work. And I believe presenting, <coughs> I have Ms. Dawn Adams, Service Manager for Commercial and Procurement. And I believe um, Mr. Dunn is with us as well. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. I'll just lead off with a, a couple of opening comments before we hand to our expert. Um, so commercialisation in local government means so many different things to so many different people, and it's a really hot topic uh, across, the, across the country. What this paper sets out to do is to describe what we think within Dorset Council, what commercialisation means within Dorset Council, and gives you a sense of the actions that we're taking to get there to be much more commercially minded as a council. Now, as I alluded to early, earlier, this is a really important topic for us because about half of our spend is with third parties, is with suppliers. So half our spend is with staff, the other half is with suppliers. And therefore, we need to give commercial thinking the same time and attention as we give to our staff management. And that's why we've developed this transformation programme to help support skill up the organisation and share best practice between the waste team and the social care team, between the passenger transport team and the IT team. So it's about sharing best practice. Now, I said that commercialisation means so many different things to so many different people. So we have structured it in four separate sections. So first of all, we've got a theme of behaving in a business-like way. So the skills, the values, the behaviours that a, a commercial organisation should have. Secondly, about being business friendly. So, for, so we buy a, a very many local services from, from the Dorset area and we want to make it as easy as possible for suppliers who are local to supply us and thus recycle the Dorset pound. Thirdly, we want to commission very, very carefully and skillfully and, and effectively. So it's about understanding our markets and the different markets and the different power and strength that we have compared to when we're buying uh, home school transport, compared to buying products from, say, Microsoft. So there's a real sense of trying to commission as a single council. And then finally, there's the theme of making money. And we've just touched on car parking charges. So there's a sense of having market awareness and, and competition. Uh, but there's also making money in the sense of, have we got any products or services that we develop, develop that can be sold to others? Uh, and any surplus can be then used to support the council. So it's, it's a big and busy area. Uh, Dawn has written a very uh, helpful paper, I'd like to think, that gives you the overview today. So I'm going to invite, uh, through you, Chair, for Dawn to take us through that paper. Today is about giving you an overview, and uh, hopefully there's a particular area that you'd like to dive into, and we could come back with more detail uh, at a future date. So uh, with your permission, I'll hand over to Dawn. Hi. Um, yes, Dawn Adams, Service Manager for Commercial Procurement. Um, as I say, as requested by the Chair, I'll run through the report and sometimes talk about the work the work has been taken place. So if I may, if I actually start at page 13, which is actually item two. 
on there. Um, in November, we established a revoked vision of our commercial strategy, very much focusing on commissioning and procurement. Before it was just procurement, we want to bring the, the emphasis of commissioning in for the whole cycle and also referring to contract management. So that, so that was cleared by Cabinet in November 21, and it endorsed at the start of the, endorsed the programme for us of being more commercially minded. As alluded to, as I've said by Aidan, there is a large number of our budget is actually on third party spend and it's important that we actually understand where we've been spent, where spend is and actually is managed properly. So that's where the commercial mind very much comes in. As part of the programme, we've established a commercial board. This is, allows us to actually focus on actually any commercial challenging conversations in place, particularly on inflationary pressures that we are all experiencing at the moment. This took over, took on from the very good work that happened during COVID-19 when we had a commercial sale. Um, actually, that's where we made our commercial decisions. So going back on the same style, we've got a commercial board to allow this a platform for officers to come to us to actually have decisions. It's very much a discussion. It's not a decision. It's actually be able to understand what the challenges are taking place, like I said, particularly on inflation, inflation pressures. If I move on to um, item four, bottom page 13, um, we, this is actually being commercially minded. It's, we've really got to have support our staff and actually understand what we mean by that, given support and training. So what we've actually been focused very much on the programme is sure we have got training there and resources there. So what's been really good is that we've actually managed to actually get a very dedicated area in the learning hub called Commercially Minded. And it's the first time we've had a platform we can actually put all our guides, our, our presentations in, so people can actually go back. So once, once we deliver something, we can put that in the Commercially Minded area and people can go back and remind them what that training was so they can dip in and out and um, use some useful stuff. So we're constantly getting asked what other things that we, go, we can put in there and then we launch it. Um, go back on to the next page, item 4.2. Contract management training course very important that we have effective contract management and we have a course for, uh, a core offer that runs throughout the year for officers to actually have a core training and I've, I've got pendency at the back to tell you what the modules are it's um it's very popular it allows us to take that time to understand what what contract management is to have the skills there and again the the learning hub area complements that training course it's got the, um, has actually got the module also got an annotated model module in the learning hub that people can go back and refresh what they've taught been taught on the course again it's in be, making sure we're supporting our staff to understand and do manage contracts well what we've also established on 4.3 is a commercial network very much wanted people to be free to actually reach out to perhaps somebody who's got a stronger in contract management or speak to suppliers all the time and it's but the person who is actually reaching out is probably not so not so quite challenging for them so we've got a commercial network so people can reach out and ask, ask for support collaboration whether whether even to shadow somebody in a contract management meeting it could be challenging so we've been, been building up on that network and often not I'm, I'm actually posting useful stuff in there as well so it is a much very much a discussion area so that's on the team site. It's, a, it's, a, it's an open site, so any officers can go in. We don't need to invite anybody in through on there. 4.4, um, this is quite, this is something that's quite, I'm, I'm finding quite exciting, actually, sadly. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, we're actually establishing a interactive webinar for negotiating and influencing. Um, I'm running a pilot this month with uh, 25 officers. This is where that, that is, is interactive. It's a way that they can actually talk, really build up the skills about negotiation, understanding, get confidence really, have those challenging conversations with whether, whether it's actually with, with suppliers, but equally be able to do, uh, do actually constructive conversations with suppliers. Because obviously we know that our suppliers are actually at strain at the moment due to the inflationary pressures, but equally our budget is you know, our budget is tight as well, so it's having those conversations. So that's going to be taking place later this month, and we're having a second pilot in December. The plan is is to actually have a recording of it without an audience, so then that will be available again in the in the learning hub for people to dip back in later through. So that that's something as well as that people have been crying out for actually. So I'm really pleased we got it off the ground. 
4.5, um, commercial training pathway. Again, we're actually building up a training pathway with learning and development, uh, along with uh, what is actually going to management development academy, is where we can actually really focus all those tools that we've got available in a manager's training pathway there and to make it more formal that you know if you're a certain, certain officer you have to do certain training to make sure we're working to a certain to a standard that's very much early days with learning development but that's that will actually bring everything more in together for that support um, the bottom page 14 number five we've actually doing business with dorset council when we came into dorset council we inherited a very unhelpful a web page. It was something that was actually, and it was exactly the same across the former districts and the Dor former Dorset County Council. It was, they tried to keep it all uniformed, but the opportunity of actually having one council, we can actually have one, one web page that actually works for our council and works for our suppliers. So we worked with, we consulted with the Chamber of Commerce and Federation of Small Businesses, and we've actually now got a much more helpful page there. Uh, we've actually added more things onto it as, as more useful stuff comes to light. So I'm very pleased that we've got that in play and they're through. And hopefully we'll get feedback. Certainly um, I'm going to be doing an update a day at some point as we come into the procurement reforms, which is a change of public sector legislation for procurement, that I'm going to try and put some more helpful things on there. I've got a little article at the moment that to try and explain to suppliers what that change is and what that could mean to them and how they could get more support. So we move on to page 15. Um, Planning commercial pipelines, as I learned that we are approaching procurement reforms, and part of that, part of the new procurement bill, intends for contract bodies, contract bodies to publish commercial pipelines ahead. So this is where suppliers can see, right, it's two years' time, that council, that local authority, is actually going to look like that contract's come to expire. I need to see how I can get in and tender for that. It's actually making sure we're much more transparent. So what we've been developing is we've got a central contracts database. We've had it for quite some time and we got a public view of that as well. They just don't see all the commercial information. But what we're trying, I've been trying to do is use that, that contracts database and develop it so it's very easy for business areas to forward plan by actually running some simple reports out of it. And what I've shared with you in appendices is also latest development, is actually we've actually developed some visual charts. Everybody likes a visual. So I thought some visual charts that people say, right, actually, I've got X amount of contracts going to expire two years' time on there. What's the opportunities of doing something differently? So I'm hoping with the visual, it will prompt some actually thinking how to be a bit more commercially minded, thinking about how, how I could procure that differently or cushion it differently and, and see what the opportunities are. So data is always key. So if we could actually make it as easy as possible for business there is to take that data out, I think this is going to be a good thing. And then through. Um, moving on to item seven, um, we actually are on a very early stage of developing a fees and charges policy on there is actually um, is making sure that we're actually approaching fees and charges in a consistent manner. It's transparent to the public, you know, whether something's full cost recovery, whether it's actually partly partly um, funded by the council. So this is so we're actually looking at all our fees and charges across the council putting them in one sort of central schedule and have a process that's quite clear across the business areas on a corporate-led way of how we review those fees and charges on an annual basis. A review it doesn't mean it's going to go up, it could go down. It's basically, we have that, that, basically that time to actually have a look at our fees and charges and understand what the budget implications are, what we're charging, and also who's using those, those services. So I said it's very early days of that. We're quite early days. We've actually got uh, it's gone to extend the leadership team on the 25th of October, and it's going to place the resource overview committee on the 24th of November. Then hopefully to cabinet in January. I, I, I know the January dates we put back now. So that's that's the work that we've been go, going through. And I said so there's an awful lot of information for you to digest in terms of the appendices. But I hope you actually could give us some feedback on the work so far and anything else you want us to explore. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adams. A, a deliberate breakneck pace. 
<laughs> it was it, it was it, it's an excellent report. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to did, did the um, executive director, Mr. Dunn, did you wish to come back on anything? Um, Mr. Selgren, did you wish to make any comment at this point? No. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'll open up to non-committee members first. I've got nothing from any non-committee members in the room. Okay. So I'll move to committee members. I'm oh, sorry. Councillor Brian. Sorry, a bit like getting my hand up. Um, one of the things I'd like to see included in this is uh, because it's, it's, this is so important to the future of this council. We have a wealth of talent amongst members who have uh, been involved, run some fairly influential businesses. And I do feel there is a part for members to play in some of these discussions. I, over the last few months, have learnt to my cost um, just how difficult it is when you're a local government uh, to actually buy things. Um, there are so many hurdles to get over, and I do think that this is something that we, uh, uh, we need to take up uh, with central government as well as locally to get some of the restrictions lifted. Um, but I do feel uh, that the, the member input in this will be absolutely essential, and I, I hope they will consider allowing members, because I'll be putting my hand up as one of the first uh, to be involved um, uh, going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bryant. You, and you picked up on some of the questions that I was going to raise as well later. Did, did, um, did you wish to respond to that, Mr Dunn? Yeah, um, two things to respond to on that. Uh, yes, absolutely, Mem member involvement and, and the insights, uh, be it from a, a general commercial pr approach, but also from the specific subject matter content. Uh, and we, we, we do see that time and time and again. And I think we've got to systemise, try and, try and bring that in more methodically. Um, the point that Councillor Bryan makes about the uh, procurement regulations and how difficult it is to buy things, I quite agree. Uh, last week, Dawn, was it last week or earlier this week, Dawn and I were on a, a call uh, last Friday on a call with um, colleagues from the uh, Department of uh, Housing Leveling Up and Communities, DLUC, um, who, who, who asked that very question. How, uh, given the financial challenges the economy is experiencing, what is it that we can do to help? And uh, Dawn was, was able to articulate that very well. And I'll just give a, a simple example, and Dawn might be able to say it a bit better. One of the things that we normally do as a council, or traditionally do, is when a contract comes to an end, the contract end date is the contract's end date, and there's not a lot that we can do about that, so we buy the same thing again and hope we get a better, better price. So a more sophisticated approach is, as Dawn was describing, is having a much further time horizon, know that it's going to come to an end in two years' time, and actually be able to think, actually, could we, do we need to buy that? Could we buy something differently? In fact, do, could we provide it ourselves? And all those sort of... And indeed, is there a market out there? Transport's a classic example. Uh, you know, is, is there a market? Is there anything we can do to stimulate the market? So if we tell suppliers that in two years' time we're going to be buying this, you may wish to set up a company to supply us. So there's, there's that bit. The point that Dawn was making is one of the things that we've been unable to do in the past is to extend our contracts very easily because they're time-limited. And that's one of the restrictions that we want lifted right now because what we're seeing is... If we, when a contract comes to an end, given the rate of inflation and the churn in the market at the moment for transport, I keep coming back to transport, if we retender, then the prices come back for the same product, 30, 40, 50% higher for the same thing. If we're able to say to the supplier, I know your contract's come to an end, but actually for another year, we'll extend for another year or two if you can hold the price at that level. That's what we want to be able to do. That's what a commercially minded local authority would do. We're restricted in what we, in being able to do that. That's an example of one of the restrictions that we're lobbying for, and I think that would be sort of generally helpful for, for all. Could, could, could I ask Dawn to say a little bit more? 
Yes, so yeah, the lovely law that me and um, Councillor Bryan often chat about <laughs> is public contract regulations. And it does, uh, the current regulations allows us to do a modification of the contract, and we've been, it allows us to make a change up to 50%. Now, before COVID-19, I mean, this is what regulations, we've had no reason to go down to, to be honest with you. We, we started, we used it probably oddly on LGR to extend a few contracts because we have former district, former county council coming together and made sense to wait and converge. Um, but during COVID-19, part of the commercial sales decision, we had to extend some frameworks um, and some frameworks and contracts because we could not tender it because it'd be an, be, the providers were barely coping go out to tender at that point in time just did not make commercial sense. So we used that regulation to extend. What I would lose, what was discussed on um, Friday, the new procurement bill is actually going to restrict us further on that particular modification. It's only going to allow you to modify up to 10%. And we're basically of barely nothing. And that's the point that I raised on Friday. This, you know, this and actually is going to give us tighter restrictions we've got at the moment when the procurement bill is supposed to free us up. And that's one of the things I think it's, it's, it's going to... At the moment, we, we need to have that commercial flexibility because, as I said, we can go out to tender for transport. I likely the tender's going to come at significantly higher. I think we came to one board last year and reflected that we went out to tender for tyres and they came in at 63% higher than we were paying then. We used that reg regulation to actually modify what we had to have some to give us some thinking time and work with the suppliers in that market and we've actually gone out to tender differently because we were allowed to do that so that's that's a good example and we, we just need to have this flexibility to see what the markets are so that's that's uh, the crunch of the matter <laughs> thank you thank you that's that's some really good information there thank you i'm um, just interested to know when you went in to see the department of leveling up did you ask and reinstate the, the um rsg um, which would have been beneficial. I think every member in a council authority and every officer would like that to happen. Just wonder whether you missed your opportunity, Mr Dunn. Uh, every opportunity we ask for our fair share of the national resource. So we made that point number one point. Thank you. Very pleased to hear it. Councillor Took. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, that was excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I think for the council to become more commercial is, is, is what we need to do. Um, and this applies not just in procurement, um, and I'm pleased that we are being more commercially procured, a little bit more hard-nosed with some of the suppliers, um, and, and, and perhaps less willing to take them at what they've done before is what we want again, because it not necessarily is. Uh, so I'm very happy to hear that. The other side of this is what we sell, services that we sell. Um, and there are a few of those. Um, and I'd, I'd quite like to see us be a little bit more commercial in pushing some of those services. Um, and that requires a, not, not a procurement head on, it requires a sales head. So are, are we looking to, to sell some of these services using what you might call professional salespeople, rather than people who've worked in local government for many years. Uh, is there a thought of, of stepping outside, getting a couple of whiskers with shiny glasses and sharp suits, um, and getting them in to sell some of these services? Can I, um, this, it, Councillor Took, I think, raises a very good point, which someone was going to ask, and that is specifically, are we looking to recruit those people from private industry to do those types of negotiations, those contract works? That's a very good point raised. Uh, th thank you for that. So, um, just, I wonder if a, a case study would be helpful around our services to schools. So, as a council, we provide um, or, or sell services in particular to school academies, be that a payroll service, HR support or finance support, uh, ranging through to th some educational services as well. Predominantly, we, we sell them at cost with a contribution to our overhead. So, we're not seeing this as a major sort of cash cow. We're not looking to make huge amounts of money, but we are looking for a contribution to the running costs of the organisation. One of the subtleties, just to, just to give a flavour, of what being commercial in a local government sense is, 
some of our smaller schools, uh, frankly, can't necessarily afford the full cost price. So one of the things that we consider is whether we have effectively a lower cost price sort of subsidize the service because it's a trade-off between we're in the business of making sure Dorset's children have a, have a great education. If the school has to go somewhere else and go through their own procurement exercise to find their own payroll service to try and in a way they can afford, it distracts the school from the education business. So on occasion, what we mean by being commercial is taking that judgment about actually some services we might have to make a little bit of a loss on. And that's, that's a, uh, that in our mind as a commercial uh, organization, that's having a commercial head. Conversely, the point, uh, one of the things that we, uh, as we've come together as a council over recent years, is from a school's customer perspective, they come to the council and if they want some state service, they need to know the state's number, they have to know the payroll team's number, they have to know the HR team's number, and we're not joined up. So one of the things that the uh, children's services have done is, is put together a single point of contact, one front door as it were, and put an account manager, so that an account manager, a salesperson, in that space, so that when we get the phone call saying, actually, I'd like a payroll service, oh, absolutely, yes, would you like some estate service as well? You know, that kind of upselling, which we think helps contribute to the cost of running the council, but is also beneficial to the school. Conversely, while all that's happening, there's a commercial risk to us, because as more and more schools become academies, then the academies themselves have their own offer or their own payroll team. So there's both a, a, an opportunity for us through account management, recruiting the right people to, to upsell, but there's also a risk to us that the more we invest in selling that service, the more exposed we are to having those costs, which we might not be able to cover as schools in line with the government policy start to go their own way as an academy. So I'll just I use that as a, a case study. And um, we are interested in bringing in commercial skills. And perhaps if uh, through you, Chair, Ms. Selwyn might want to comment, some of the sharpest commercial thinkers we've got in, in this organization or in his team, in the waste team, it's a really good example. Thank you. Before I come back to you, Councillor Took, Mr. Selgren. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, I, just that, so thank you for bringing me in. So the, the waste service is, is, is a very good case in point. So the Council runs a commercial trade waste service that picks up uh, trade waste from businesses. We do that in a commercial marketplace, so we compete alongside brand names that you recognise. Indeed, you can see their vehicles in, in Dorset Streets. Uh, although, um, Chairman, we were in, in Sherbourne for the uh, Jubilee uh, celebrations, I couldn't help noticing that our uh, crews went in very early in the morning to do all the business collections. Sadly, our commercial competitors uh, didn't choose to do that on that occasion. So again, I'm very proud of the commercial service that we provide because we provide a good, good quality service and also at a good price. To, make, to just reinforce the points that Dunn has made about commercialism, so legally, as a council, we're not able to make a profit on that commercial waste service. That's a, that's a stipulation. What we can do, as Mr Dunn describes, we can recover, and we do need to recover the overheads that we're doing it. One of the examples of transformation uh, that we've put in place since creating the new Dorset Council is we put a new uh, computer system into the commercial waste team, which is enabling them to be much, much quicker and more responsive in terms of giving a price to our businesses. So we'll get a, an approach from a business client who says, uh, we would like the council to uh, give us a price for picking up our trade waste. They will describe to us broadly what their requirements are. From that, we can provide them with a, a price, and then that's then set up in our system moving forward. So as, uh, as Aidan said, it's a very good example of a council running a commercial service, doing it in a very commercial way, and indeed uh, with commercial competitors uh, in that marketplace as well, but also working with the local government trading requirements, which prevents us making a profit. I hope that's a, a second and helpful case study. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. Councillor Took, did you wish to come back? Thank you. Um, that's quite reassuring. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we're doing that. I, it, it's very simple. It, it, in terms of selling something, you, you need to know the value to the customer. And, and you need to analyse what you're saving them, what you're doing them, and, and, and what, the, what the value to them might be, and therefore base your price around that. Now, that's possibly more commercial than we're always allowed to be, uh, sadly. Um, but I'm, I'm pleased that we are looking at being very much more commercial. So I, I, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Took. 
So, can I just um, remind you to pick up something that was said um, in terms of the commercial operation that we've got going, that we're not permitted to make a profit on those operations. Um, but we've already made a comment about the RSG um, that was withdrawn by government, which is why we've become a unitary authority to bring all those predecessor councils together to stop the duplication and make us um, more streamlined. Um, but surely that, that profit could be reinvested to benefit the residents of Dorset if the government were to move the goalposts. I'm not quite sure I understand why we're being hamstrung by not being able to make a profit that could then be reinvested in the council that would, would benefit us, benefit the residents, benefit government, because they don't want to give us money, um, irrespective of whichever government's in place in Westminster. Um, it's, been, it's been a gradual decline over decades in terms of the investment that's been made from government into, into local council authorities. I think fundamentally what sits behind this is, is that belief that councils and public services are here to provide just that, a public service. So councils can and do have that ability to provide trade, trade waste because often um, actually the commercial market for good commercial reasons doesn't step into that space and yet our businesses as, as customers uh, and you know need that service and therefore we're able to provide it. So that is the current uh, legislative position. I could speculate about uh, if the government were to uh, change the position on that philosophically philosophically what the consequence might be but it is as you would say we would we would we would operate this in the same way that we do currently as a commercial business if we were permitted to, to, to make a profit of course that would be returned uh, into the into the council's coffers i know we've got mr may with us uh, this morning he just might want to comment because this this issue about the uh, what are called the margins of trading for local government are very clearly prescribed and have been established in statute for a long long period of time so it just might be worth him giving you a little bit of a, a perspective in response to uh, your question add to add to the comments that I've made. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. You must have eyes on the back of your head. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you, you asked why, and and the, and the why is be, because it's the, the law. I won't speculate why it's the law, but, but very, very broadly, there are those services that we um, pr provide to the public. They're provided free as public services. There are also those instances where we can charge on a um, cost recovery basis, and that's what Mr. Dunn has been describing. And part of this is about understanding what are our full costs so that we maximise our ability to recover. And then there's that third instance where the law does allow us to trade for a profit, so not simply cover our costs, but to... Um, trade for a profit with other bodies. Um, for instance, uh, we sell a, a legal service and my services as a monitoring officer to the Fire and Rescue Authority. We don't simply cover our costs in doing that. We, we trade for profit on a public body to public body basis. But it is very restricted. Um, there, are, there are restrictions, and they are very restrictive, around the circumstances in which we can actually go out there into the market and trade um, for a profit. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you. And can I extend that point until Jonathan taps me on the shoulder and says I've gone too far? The, one of the things that a local authority can do is set up a company to trade, and that, that company itself can make a profit. Chairman, that, that, that is absol absolutely right. And, and, and I think having that trading vehicle, not only is it a, a, a legal is essential when you're trading in certain circumstances, it, it also creates a different environment and it encourages us all to think differently. We establish a trading company, we give it um, ob object, ob objectives, and then it encourages all of us to think more commercially and to look for those trading op op opportunities. So yes, trade, trading through a company vehicle. Okay, Mr. Mr. Dunn, then I've got Mr. Selgren. And uh, forgive me, I get carried away with the enthusiasm on this. Um, so one of the things we could do is, is set up a trading company, but then being commercially minded, we have to, we have to be very clear why we're setting it up. So let me, I'll give you a hypothetical example. One of the things that we that costs us a lot at the moment is home to school transport. There's not many taxi companies that we operate. One of the things we could do is set up our own taxi company that would disrupt the market, lead to some price competition, 
and generally, ideally, make prices lower for us. Uh, so that could be helpful. Conversely, we have to ask ourselves, are we in the business as a local authority of, try, of competing with pri existing private sector businesses? Do we want to be in the market to undercut? So there's, on the one hand, we can disrupt the market because it might get us a better deal. On the other hand, if we go too far, we put companies out of business, which isn't necessarily, as John was saying, as a council. So there's, there's that whole extension of commercial thinking. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dunn. You, you, you touch on a question I've got to ask later, yes. Mr Selgren. Uh, Chairman, if members would find it helpful uh, to have a case study of uh, where a, a council has created uh, a trading company at scale, for those reasons, I can uh, give you that. So uh, I worked for a period for Norfolk County Council, and during the time I was there, one of the things that uh, I helped do was to set up what is now known as the Norse Trading Company. Members are uh, welcome to look on the internet at, uh, at the Norse activity. The reason that was set up is very much as, as Aidan has just described. The council was finding that it simply couldn't find people in the marketplace to provide some of the services it wished to commission. And therefore, in terms of making that make or buy decision, it decided the answer was to set up a trading company to fill that space and meet the council's own requirement. Because it had done that, um, it, it, it obviously was in the company was operating as a commercial business and was saying, as any company would in that situation, well, if we're providing this service to the council, we're carrying certain overheads in our business. For example, it ran a transport service, so it had a, a garage and workshops and so on and took the view that said, well, if you've got these things, then could we improve the efficiency of that by trading that service out more widely in the commercial market? And that is broadly the way in which the, the Norse model works. So it's, it's exactly as Aidan describes, is getting into that balancing point of ensuring that the council safeguards its ability to procure services in the market, albeit through direct provision from a, from a council-owned company, but without displacing the legitimate activities of, of the commercial sector. And that, as, as Ms. Dunn describes, is a very, very fine balance for any council. But I think uh, the general view on Norse is that balance has been struck correctly. In terms of your point, Chairman, about the return to the council, so Norfolk County Council is a shareholder in that company and receives a dividend from its trading profits, which it does plough back into its own core uh, budget and therefore provides, uh, in a sense, the council taxpayer sees some benefit from the return of the Norse trading activities. Uh, I hope that's helpful, Chairman. If, if members wish to go further, I'm sure we can, because um, Mr Dunn's also had experience of the Norse uh, trading operation in his previous work in Suffolk. So I think between us, uh, we could probably share a little bit more information about how uh, commercial, uh, sorry, local government-owned commercial companies operate in that sort of space. But I hope that's um, a useful example. Thank you, Mr Selkren. Uh, I've made a note of that. We'll return to that later on in the, in the discussion. Um, you didn't want to return? Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Andrews. Sorry for the, for the delay in getting to you. No, that's fine, Chair. Um, a lot of my questions have been answered. I had about eight, but um, they've uh, whittled away. Um, do we uh, work with partnership in other councils, such as Wiltshire and, and Somerset, so we, we gain economies of scale? Can we, in fact, do that? Uh, it was one of my questions. Um, public contract regulations, do we lobby uh, ministers if we want to get rid of them? Um, you've already explained that complicated that could be um uh and that's about it really left <laughs> well, everything else i wanted is has been answered is it miss adams yes um certainly we do collaborate we're actually part of laser group which is actually um it's led, led by kent county council but we're all equal partners on the laser group we all got a say and that's actually came out of uh, well we're members of the central buying consortium it came out of central buying consortium history so they've been running for nearly 30 years and we've been uh, this came off of the former dorset county council they were member, member about 25 years so the cbc started before the laser group and it's because we were all buying energy in a different way and we all came together and did a collaborative of arrangement. We, um, historically, we have actually have worked with other councils, um, not re so much recently. For example, I did lead a stationary contract for, for my sins across the southwest, you know, analysing cost of pens. But um, people have moved away so much to think things like that now. Councils have gone very electronic. We're, 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 you know, we're all, we're all PCs, so traditional purchasing of stationery. So that just died because we just didn't have any need anymore, really, to actually get any, any gains from a collaborative. So we do look at opportunities. We have worked um, historically as well with uh, BCP, um, and they, they actually access a number of our frameworks, certainly mostly around highways. 
So they've come in, their contribution is working on the specification with us. So they put their spend in and they, they expect if they're going to, somebody's going to collaborate, they've got to bring something to the table, not just having a free ride back on our procurement. So we do look at it. So highways is another good example where they do work very collaboratively with their neighbouring authority. Thank you. Councillor Andrews. Thank you very much. The, yeah, very comprehensive answer, so thank you for that. Um, and I just wonder if our new unitary next door to us has asked for any consultative advice on the, on the unitary, and it might be an opportunity. Just a thought. Mr. Selgren. Chairman, if I may, just very briefly. So we've explained that the uh, statutory restrictions on local government trading are significant, and they're there for good reasons. Um, certainly when it comes to trading cross-border, those become even an even tighter consideration. So that for a good reason, um, you know, the, the points I've explained about councils providing trade services like the commercial waste service are to make sure that uh, Dorset businesses are able to access uh, a good quality and value for money service. And therefore, government will rightly, statute doesn't take a particularly favourable view towards councils seeking to extend those activities into neighbouring areas. And it's for that reason that many councils go the route, as Norfolk did, um, of setting up those arms length trading companies. Um, so again, it, it, it's just to be mindful that we are we are working in quite a tightly constrained uh, legislative regime when we when we when we're dealing with trading. On the specific point about helping our colleagues in in Somerset, um, uh, my colleague Karen Punchard, known to many members in this chamber, has been working very closely to support uh, Somerset in in the setting up of the unitary there, and in particular bringing some of the experience of the Dorset Waste Partnership, which she, she managed for many years, uh, to help them with uh, with their setup arrangements. So yes, 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 we are. Um, and uh, that I think they found found very helpful. Thank you, um, Councillor Took. Sorry, um, Mr. Mayor, you wish to come in. Sorry, Councillor Took. Chairman, it was simply that I, I think Councillor Andrews also had a question about lobbying for cha uh, changes to the um, to the regulations um, and the pub the public contracts regulations. You, you would expect me to say that as the lawyer in the room, but actually the regulations, um, to a large part, do, do serve us well. Um, they're there for a reason. They drive us to have to demonstrate value through, through competition. Um, so, so, so absolutely, where, where we need to see changes to the regulations, uh, we, we would push for that. But the regulations do serve this really important purpose of ensuring um, that where we're spending public money, um, there is proper comp competition and, we're, and we are able to demonstrate that we've obtained value for money. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Took. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it was just a very small point. Um, it, it was mentioned a moment ago that, that working cross-border would um, give us even more restrictions. Um, and I was just wondering, is it, we can set up a commercial venture. Can we set up a joint venture commercially, so with other councils? And, and would that have fewer restrictions? Mr. Selgren. Thank you, Chairman. Just to clarify for Councillor Took, so um, the, and again, I'm perhaps I might look to Mr. Mayor to confirm what he may wish to do so in fairness, because uh, uh, this is a very, very complex area of local government law. But in the main, in simple, in simple terms, a council's ability to trade largely relates to its, its own geographical, its own administrative area. And uh, there are specific requirements that relate to particular services, which actually make trading of a council's core services, i.e. those that it runs, like we do the commercial, commercial waste service, over the border, quite challenging. Um, so as I said, that's the reason why uh, some councils have gone the route of setting up um, Wholly owned, uh, wholly owned local government companies. And again, if I use the example of Norse, one of the things that they've done is they have provided that service to other councils. What they do, exactly as Council Took describes, they set up a joint venture company. So, for example, at one time they had one with Wigan. So they had Norse Wigan Limited, and that was a partnership with Wigan Council, where Wigan Council received some of the dividend from the trading activities that took place in their area. And actually, Norfolk County Council, similarly through the Norse arrangement, saw some, some return to them as well. So, so those arrangements exist. There are examples that we could uh, point members towards. We could bring you further information about those. But those, to, to deal with cross-border trading, that's largely where councils have gone. It's where you start using um, your, effectively, arm's-length commercial vehicle to do it. 
because I say the, the, there are, for, and again, I would argue for good reasons why um, council core activities are discouraged from, from leaking over the border into, into other areas because that, that not only has the, runs the risk of creating market distortion, but also clearly we have a very clear understanding about, um, you know, in another council's jurisdiction, they do what they do. Um, so just, it, 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 I say this is a complex area, but I hope we're describing in, in clear terms so that members can get a flavour of what this council might wish to do going forward, which I think is where your, your question is perhaps driving. Mr. Mayor, did you want to add anything at that point? Chairman, I think that's a, a, a really clear description. Thank you. So nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, so nothing to come back with? No? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. Um, I think... Yeah, I've, I've had a question about the, the sensitivities around us being commercially minded and being in... Um, a competition then with our local businesses within the, the the county area that we obviously derive a business rates tax from so it's a very sensitive and delicate area isn't it um thank you if i can just go to within the report at 3.1 on page 13 commercial board i'd just like to get an understanding around how the setup of that because the description of it um of that work of that commercial board um it sounds like it's the work of scrutiny um can i just have a an explanation as to how that's actually going to work. It does sound very much like it's doing a scrutiny role, to my mind. Okay, thank you, Chair. So, um, the commercial board and uh, how it operates at the moment. So, it's a, an officer board. We meet once a month with senior representatives from each directorate. And the sort of issues that we're grappling with uh, are you know, a classic example is when the fuel price really peaked um, earlier in the summer. We were getting a lot of pushback from our suppliers, uh, in particular uh, transport operators, uh, saying we can't carry on providing the, the service, uh, transporting children to school or, or whatever, unless you give us more money. And the conversation at the commercial board was to explore the implications of that, to explore the implications that if we did give bus operators more money, what does that mean in terms of staff travel costs or uh, the cost of transport uh, of our carers visiting out in uh, social care, all of whom are reliant on fuel. So, the, so the, what, it, what the commercial board is, is an opportunity for senior representatives from each part of the organization to get together to tease through the implications and the wider implications of some really quite pressured operational decisions. So this is, it's um, a, a officer, thinking space that l would lead through to recommendations either to the senior leadership team or indeed if it's around a budget change ultimately through to cabinet so it's um a, an operational sort of advisory group rather than trying to do the role of scrutiny is how i describe it a think tank yeah yeah okay okay i can live with that okay um in the report 4.1 through to 4.3, um, the training programs that you're putting in place and that background work that you're doing with officers is is, is really good. Um, is there any member input in that, or are members able to have access into those into those sites as well? Is that purely office, officer driven? Um, just picking up again at, at um, 4.4 negotiations of contracts. Does it follow the private enterprise modelling or not? enterprise modelling or not. Have we looked at other council authorities and done the comparison with what goes on in those and within the real world in the private market? And as was already alluded to earlier in the discussion about um, using members' experience from their predecessor lives before they become councillors and sign their lives away um, and, and the knowledge that they can actually bring to that field. Thank you. 
If I, I talk to you about the contract management training, yes, certainly that's something that you know members can actually be able to access. Um, I don't recall very early days in Dorset Council I did a members <coughs> workshop. I mean, it seems a blur now, but it was actually in 2019. Um, certainly, and I'll be quite happy to run something like that again. But the, the commercially minded area, you should be able to get access to that. You, you know, you've actually be able to see all the resources that are available in there. And certainly, I would welcome you uh, councillors who want to attend a contract management train and see what's there and certainly negotiation influencing um, webinars interactive webinars because I said once we have the two, two pilots done they will be available and it may be something that um, councillors will find useful to add input and reflect on in and put their experience into it and how we could actually tweak it for the future so yes welcome that If I could just comment on the theme of learning from other local authorities, and John's given a, an example of his experience from, from Norfolk with Norse, and I, I've had similar experience when I worked in Suffolk uh, County Council who had a, a series of joint ventures and arm's length companies. So I think there's experience within the organisation, but we're not, it doesn't stop there, we're not sort of complacent. So some of the training that we're getting is uh, from a specialist that train, trains local government generally. And then Dawn in particular is tapped into various networks, both the formal buying consortium that she talked about earlier, but also local government association networks as well, sharing best practice. And I, I think without, well, yes, blowing Dawn's trumpet for her, we're, we're seen as, uh, in terms of the way we've structured this transformation programme, you're advising others, Dawn is advising others on what we're doing as an example of good practice. Um, but I think there's, there's different strengths and different uh, areas for development across the country um, and we're certainly not complacent so keen to learn from others thank you and I quite like the idea of a, of a webinar to get that member buy-in around, around that that activity when the council has gone on in your background with the officers I think that would be hugely beneficial to the members to get that member buy-in yeah thank you just wanted to touch on again about us being commercially minded um, and there's something I've spoken to you before Mr Dunn and that is about um, the charges that we make from a, a, a scrutiny point of view charges for services that Dorset Council make to its residents um, that we need to be mindful of that double taxation accusation from a, a, a PR point of view um, that's something that we need obviously to be foremost in our minds I just wanted to make that, that point. I don't need to labour on it. You're obviously taking that into consideration with what you've already said. Um, at 7.8, you talk about pressures on the council um, being inflationary. But I just wondered how much of that is not just inflationary at the moment with pressures on the council. Surely we're still suffering from the knock-on effects of the loss of revenue and cost due to the COVID-19 pandemic that we're not budgeted for. I mean, surely that is still an ongoing um, burden to the council having got over that COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> Sorry, Chair, I couldn't see a 7.8 on the version of the report that I've got in front of me. Are you able... No. Whether that's an earlier version... 7.4. Uh, but... <laughs> So a question about the sort of the legacy of the pandemic, is that? Sorry, there, there is always pressure on the council's budget, but at the current time, this is particularly due to inflation. But I just wanted to highlight the fact that I'm assuming we've obviously got other pressures to the council that was the knock-on effect from the COVID-19 pandemic, additional costs that were incurred that weren't budgeted for, and obviously a loss of revenues, um, particularly in Councillor Bryant's um, portfolio with car parks when there was no, no travel during that period, so we lost a terrific amount of revenue. That must be an ongoing knock-on effect to the council and its budgetary requirements. Yes, the, um, thank you. So the latest uh, budget position was, uh, quarter two was talked through the cabinet last week and is going, or week before, and is going to be explored at the audit committee on Monday. I think uh, one of the points to note, um, it's not just inflation that's putting us under pressure. There is um, 
linked to inflation is the pay award. So the pay award was agreed uh, last week, nationally negotiated. So it's linked to inflation, but that's putting us under significant pressure. But one of the things uh, you reference COVID is, is the legacy in terms of the level of demand for care. So what we're seeing in adult care services in particular is the pressure uh, oh, the, the hospitals are very are busier now than ever before. There's a, a real need and urgency to, to, for patients to be discharged from hospital. I'll just give you a flavors, flavor of those numbers. So pre-pandemic in 2019, uh, during the course of the year, 624 patients were discharged from Dorset hospitals into our care, costing about 4.1 million. In 2022, so this year so far, it's 1,675. So that's, it was 624 patients discharged. This year so far, it's 1,675. And that is costing us 15 million this year compared to the 4.1 in 2019. So that's indeed a bit of a legacy from COVID and then kind of a, not necessarily COVID related symptoms, but it's just that sheer volume of demand. And so it's those sort of issues that the adult care team and indeed the rest of the organisation are grappling with. And that's some of the pressures that will be reflected in this year's budget and indeed the budget over future years as well. Well, Ms. Fisher, I asked the question. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. It's quite frightening figures, actually. Okay. So can I just move to going back to that commercial board? Two questions around that. Firstly, I presume it's answerable to scrutiny. And secondly, um, the members that sit on that sit on the SLT, some of them. So is there a, and I appreciate we've already established a think tank, but is there a conflict of interest there? And it doesn't quite, it's not quite the same as it is with members, but you've got officers that are the think tank there that are then on the SLT team and that information is being fed up. I just, just open the transparency, I just want to get that into the open as to how the thinking is around that. <laughs> yeah, sure, uh, I'm sure Raiden will add something. Um, I think what we're trying to do with that, Chairman, is, is to very much use it as a kind of critical friend challenge. So I, I take the example that, that Aidan used earlier. The issue for the council is, is almost any time it agrees to an inflationary increase, um, there's a risk that sets a precedent because we're a public organisation that's very visible. You know, the world talks, the, our media provide coverage, those sorts of things. So, you know, Dorset Council agreeing to increase in transport prices, the rest of the world is going, oh, we know if they'll agree to that, what about us? So that's why we have colleagues from children and adults in, for example, because clearly if we agree um, to increase energy prices to our transport suppliers, then some of our care home providers and children's settings providers will come in and say, well, fine, if you're giving them an, up, an uplift, we, we're, we're bearing the cost of additional energy prices, therefore you should give us an equivalent uplift. So I think to explain, I mean, I would challenge actually, because I'm not sure it is a think tank. I, for, for me, what this is doing is providing that, that critical friend challenge. Are the, are the decisions we're taking to particular things the right ones to take? Are they robust? Are they well advised? Are they well evidenced? And in particular, to making sure that wherever we can, we resist those pressures. And we do that with that wider benefit. Clearly, my colleagues in transport are very, very tuned into that market. Um, but actually, having an understanding of what's going on in other parts of the market with which the council interacts is making sure that we make sound commercial decisions. Mr. Dunn may want to add a little bit more to that, but that, that from where the part I play in that and where I, where I try to use the expertise of the commercial board to support the decision making in the place directorate, that's very much how I feel it, it works for me as executive director. Okay, I, I'm still not quite sure where the scrutiny aspect of this, this fits in. So with what that commercial board's doing and then feeding that up to the SLT team, when you've got officers that are sitting in both both camps, um, you talk about being the critical friend, and 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 it almost feels like it's doing a scrutiny process. I just I just can't get my head around where actually we come in as as a committee into that process. Fine, Chairman, I'll just answer that person. Mm, of course. Sorry, it, it seems to me the, where the commercial board is to move that information up into the SLT team. It's that drift between the two that there is. There doesn't seem to level scrutiny in that bit. That's that's the sort of thing I'm struggling to get my head around at the moment. Yeah, 
I think you raised two, two, two really good questions, Joe, and unhelpful, useful for me to have the opportunity to perhaps to clarify that. So in terms of what the membership of that commercial board does, um, in a sense, although some of those things relate to the directorate, so let me, let me give you an example. So the, when we look at the transport issue, the head of service for transport, Sue McGowan, will come to the board and she will present a paper. So in that capacity, I don't, in a sense, I, I don't sit there with my role to be executive director for place and to advocate the, the need for an inflation increase in the service. What I'm providing that is a level of um, senior expertise in commercial management, along with a number of other colleagues who have similar experience drawn from across the organisation. So I say, clear when I sit in that role, I'm not there as, as in a sense, as the director of a place to advocate for the service, but to provide that critical friend commercial challenge, indeed, into my own directorate, as, as my colleagues in adults and children's are doing as well. So that's, that's where I describe it as a critical friend challenge process. The other point you raise, and I, it's a good one, is, is around where the, the member scrutiny comes into that. Um, and I think, again, that, that is largely what we will do with our um, portfolio holders, because when we're making decisions of that kind, so again, let me stick with the transport example, we engage very, very closely with Councillor Bryan around the issue about the inflationary increases in transport. So the member scrutiny to the officers is coming through that, that portfolio hold, holder challenge. Uh, and similarly, Mr Dunn will advise members in his capacity as the council's section 151 officer. So if he feels that the place director is, you know, not necessarily being as robust as it might be around a particular decision, then clearly he has that position in law as the council section 151 officer to say, I don't believe this is the, the, the best financial decision for the council. And similarly, of course, the monitor officer can offer a challenge in, in a similar sort of way. But the member challenge is coming through the portfolio holder. Okay, thank you. And then obviously the, the, the portfolio holders then are answerable to scrutiny. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think officers alluded to earlier about the procurement bill, and that is, I had a question around that, but you've obviously taken that on board. That procurement bill is obviously going to be restricted to us rather than as advantageous as it should have been. Um, so I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it at that. Um, so so part of this was to review various aspects of, the, of, of this report that was laid out in the report. And just want to come to that adult procurement. When you looked at that tab the tables you've got, adult procurement is considerable. It's, it is absolutely massive. And I believe much of this is to additional bed capacity that we buy in. Um, and I just wondered whether there was any work that's going on in the background or proposed work to look at how we can actually do that better. And so it's not such a burden in, on the on the on the council purse, because I know that we buy in a lot of that bed provision and a lot of it's not used because we haven't got a crystal ball and we don't know whether there's going to be the need for it or not. I don't know if you want to make a comment at this point or not. Uh, I'll, I'll make a, a general uh, comment, if, if I may. Uh, yeah, adult, adult care is our largest area of uh, spend and the, the activity of buying uh, capacity, particularly residential care for older people, that's our sort of the largest category. So we need to be as good as possible and we're as effective as possible about that. It is a market, so uh, there's a, an element of uh, price involved and one of the things that we try and do is the price be the price maker. We set the price that we're prepared to pay for care uh, across Dorset and that has to be carefully negotiated to make sure that the providers are prepared to provide that care at that price because frankly they could sell their beds to private payers. So there's that element of market. In some areas where we need the geographical, geographically where we need particular numbers of beds, rather than going for a spot purchase, as in we'll buy a bed when we need it because we know there'll be the supply out there, sometimes we need to secure specific supply. So we block purchase uh, a series of beds. And so we have to pay for them whether there are residents, customers in those beds or not. So, so that, that in itself brings up a different skill of contract management. So on the first block purchasing, oh, sorry, on the spot purchasing is the skill of knowing your market and being able to hold on to the price that we've previously negotiated. For the effective management of a block contract, the skill is making sure that we've gotten, that those beds are full 
all the time because we've got to pay for them one way or the other. So just sort of just a little flavor of some of the complexity within adult care that I'm sure many, many colleagues are already aware of. Thanks. Thank you, members. I'm not aware of any further questions from members. So with the recommendation, it was, to, it was to, if we wanted to review any of the aspects of what's in the report, um, and I should remind members that in there's two further reports to come surrounding this. So in March 23, there will be an information and discussion on the topic of contract management under being under being commercially minded. That's what we're going to do next. And then in May 23, the committee is to be provided an understanding from a business area how they manage a contract. It's the committee to identify which contract they wish to focus on for that discussion. Okay, so there's two further reports coming. So in terms of this one and what we would wish to review. Do members have any 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 view? I've got a couple ideas myself. Okay, so um, one was to explore the setting up of trading companies such as Semprovision, Child School Transport. Do you think would it be possible to have a, a, a review of that, a piece of work surrounding that? If we would be more commercially minded, um, with all the sensitivities that brings about actually being operating within a commercial world against other businesses within the county. Um, another one is a review about that adult procurement, which I think is such a drain on the resources within this council authority because we've become a retirement county. And I've board members infinitum over the, the issues surrounding that for, for many years now. Um, and, I, and I would suggest also a review around that um, inflation plus the ongoing effects of COVID and how they're impacting on our transformation and our, and our budgetary requirements. I know we've got the budget coming up, but I think some background information on that would be good as well. So that was the three, was it, I think, the three aspects to review. Would that, how do members feel? Is that okay? Yeah, so we'll, we'll take that as a recommendation then. So, um, Ms. Adams and, and Mr. Dunn, thank you ever so much for that. Really good report and um, quite enlightening. Thank you. And thank you for your input as well, John. Okay. So I'll move on to agenda item. In ten minutes, we need to go to extend the meeting. In ten minutes, we need to go to the meeting. I know. Yeah, yeah. In in I've got my eye on the clock. In ten minutes, we need to extend the meeting. I just wonder whether members want to take a comfort break. No, for 10 minutes. Okay, so we'll return at one o'clock. Please, members and officers, thank you.
Okay, so if I return back to the agenda, agenda item nine, Dorset Council Climate and Ecology Emergency Strategy Progress Report Autumn 2022. And the recommendation is to review progress made in delivering the Dorset Council Climate and Ecological Emergency Strategy and Action Plan. And presenting, I've got Anthony Littlechild, who's the Sustainability Team Manager, and to include a PowerPoint presentation by Mr. Stephen Ford, Corporate Director, Climate and Ecological Sustainability. And I've also got the portfolio holder in the room, Councillor Ray Bryant, portfolio holder for Highways, Travel and Environment. And my apologies Chair, to... Should we not, um, extend the meeting first? I'll do. Apologies to Mr. Littlechild and to um, Mr. Ford for the length of time it's come to come, come to this agenda item. Before I do start that, could I have a proposal from a member, please, to extend the meeting? Thank you, Councillor Andrews, a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Tuck, all in favour? Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Littrell, thank you. Thank you. I will work out the technology. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've just got a, the, the report itself is quite dense, so I thought it would be useful to do a, a, a sort of fairly um, short, just summary presentation, um, if that's okay. Um, so you can just see a, a bit of our um, climate change branding, which is something we're working on. So we're developing a bit of a sub-branding for the, for the whole program as a whole, which you'll start to see sort of delivered out on things like electric vehicles and things as we go forward. Um, the report itself, I think there's two key sort of takeaway highlights, if you like. Um, the report itself focuses on our uh, carbon emissions this time. So this is part of our biannual reporting on the climate ecological emergency strategy. Um, this one focuses on carbon emissions and the two t key takeaways are um, that with the information we've got, the data we have uh, since our baseline year a few, three years ago, our carbon uh, emissions as an organisation have reduced by about 26% and the county's carbon emissions have reduced by about um, 18%. The report's got more information within it uh, and it does uh, note that the national data with which we <coughs> use to calculate the county-wide um, carbon emissions has been increased this year to include uh, agriculture which is actually an additional 30% uh, of carbon emissions. Um, but this is just comparing like-to-like -like, uh, data. Looking at that in a little bit more detail, if you compare the last three years in terms of our uh, overall carbon emissions, um, you can see that since the, the, there was obviously a, quite an impact in, from COVID, which reduced obviously our uh, staff travel and uh, commuting, etc. So there was quite a drop in 2021. And this year, it's gone up very slightly, but luckily hasn't bounced back, which may have been one of the, the, the strike risks. So we're, we're still on a, a very good um, trajectory. A few things have uh, slightly gone up this year, particularly things like commuting and business miles as staff start to return to work and we start to um, do a little bit more hybrid working. Um, but, but overall, those sorts of things will be picked up with things such as the travel plan as we move forward. What it does sort of highlight with the two dotted lines uh, is that we are actually below where we would want to be. So we're, we're doing better than we would want to be at this time of year, according to our carbon trajectory. Uh, but we've still got a way to go before we reach our first carbon target of 40% reduction by 2025. So it's still quite a challenge, uh, but still um, very good news so far. Um, some of the key areas where we've made uh, significant progress or significant inroads, I mentioned these in the last time I'd sort of updated, but obviously we've been uh, delivering the 19 million pound building retrofit through the public sector decarbonisation scheme. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we've been uh, working with our um, highways partners over, over several years to reduce the embodied carbon within the materials used for ho highways works. We're also using digital technology much more, and that's enabled this hybrid working and enabled staff to uh, work from home much more effectively. Uh, looking at our EV infrastructure, electric vehicle infrastructure, we've got some programs now to increase the uh, number of charges, um, both across the council's estate and across the county, 
and we've, we've started to purchase more electric vehicles. We've been managing our highways verges in different ways for um, reducing carbon and biodiversity, and we're, we have a program working on uh, switching more of our streetlights to um, LEDs. In terms of the public sector decarbonisation scheme, this was, this was a, a sort of nearly £19 million pound grant uh, project, which is coming sort of to an end. Uh, it's focused on decarbonising heat, so removing boilers, which um, focus on using gas and uh, other forms of fossil fuels. Um, and we've, we've done, managed to, as an organisation, do project, over 350 projects across our assets, over 200 different buildings having some form of measure, either something to do with heat or a, an, a range of energy efficiency measures or even building management system. So, so these projects are largely completed, some still going on, some still being uh, sort of finally commissioned as the project sort of wraps up. Um, and, and we're hoping from uh, the, the information that we from the sort of information that we've got that that will help to reduce our carbon emissions in our buildings by almost up to 20% going forwards. But obviously that will appear in future uh, carbon emissions calculations, and uh, that's just theoretical based on what's been installed, not necessarily how everything um, sort of operates, which we'll know later. Um, at the, the last um, scrutiny meeting, I think we had a discussion around improving the programme management uh, approach to how we meet our 2040 net zero carbon target as a council. And to this sort of end, we um, have established now a sort of senior officer operational group, so with the leads of each of the different key elements that make up our carbon footprint. Uh, and we've been working actively with the transformation team to um, improve the management information that we have in terms of being able to understand wh where we're going, our progress, our trajectory, understand the risks to delivery, some of the issues and some of the interdependencies between different strands and different uh, work packages in that program. Um, and that's going to enable us to uh, report to a newly formed group, which is a CLT uh, uh, group, particularly looking at the climate and ecological emergency priority that council has uh, adopted. Um, sorry, just going back to that. One. So, that, so that helps us to know where we are on our path to meeting uh, 2040 net zero target. Uh, and um, it provides us a sort of simple visual representation of where we are with a bit of some simple rag rating of where we are currently and where we think we might be uh, by, 20, by our next target, 2025. To support that, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. So the transformation team are helping us to pull together a sort of very detailed uh, work program. Here's just a sort of snippet of the team's uh, planner extract that relates to that program. And this w is trying to help us make sure that we've, we understand exactly what we need to do to meet these targets. Uh, and we're having regular ongoing discussions now with each of the leads um, and uh, gaining a, a, a good grasp of exactly where we need to go and programmes of work needed to deliver on the 2040 target. Supporting all of that work, uh, we've also been working with our colleagues in communications to um, strengthen the whole uh, sort of communications elements of, of what we're doing um, and uh, how we're progressing towards our net zero targets, both internally and externally. So you've seen the new sub-branding um, that was sort of starting to develop. Um, and we've also done a whole range of other things in terms of strengthening our media coverage, uh, developing campaigns. So we currently have a campaign running on energy efficiency savings for, for staff and, uh, and the general public to support the um, cost of living crisis and give people advice and guidance on where they can go for reducing energy. Uh, We've also been making sure that a lot of the content is much more um, accessible. And uh, um, so this is all still a bit of a work in progress on the, on the communication side of things. But we've got some, um, there's, there's further work going on to uh, develop our sub-branding. There's some key stories that we're highlighting. So we're doing some key focus work around things like the public sector decarbonisation scheme, trying to pick out some good case studies so that we have sort of people stories. Uh, and much, much more, much to come. Next. 
Uh, one of the key areas on communications is our website, so we've been giving that a, a thorough revamp in terms of the pages that were there were available for the um, climate change uh, side of things, which were quite, sort of quite hidden, but also um, quite difficult to sort of access key information. So these have had a complete facelift. Here's an example of what it's going to look like, but it's not yet gone live. Um, and the idea is really to sort of be very action-focused, enable um, those looking at the website to find out what we're doing as an organization and also what they could do as individuals or as organizations. So there'll be lots of signposting, lots of advice, and a sort of focus on, on action. Um, and an opportunity for a bit of a participation, so we'll be able to pick up some case wider case studies across the county, county, which we'll be able to sort of feed into that work. We've also been trying to work hard strengthening our partnership engagement, so we've had um, some sort of joint sessions with uh, town and parish councils, and we've had some sessions with the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, in terms of providing advice to businesses on what they can do around um, climate change and ecology. I've uh, been working with uh, our colleagues in, in um, uh, Dorset uh, DAPTAC and we have been working with colleagues at BCP and other local authorities. We're also in the process of setting up a public sector decarbonisation group to pull together all the key public sector stakeholders. Uh, and I've been working with some of our strategic partners, particularly on things like uh, grid, which is one of our um, key constraint issues. So we've been working closely with um, some of the grid operators such as SGN and uh, SSEN. So what's next? Well, um, I think I updated on some of this before, but we're in the process of, uh, of refreshing the strategy and action plan to give it a little bit of a, a clearer focus, make sure we've picked up um, more clearly on the carbon, ecology, and uh, resilience elements of our program. Uh, and to reflect the, the uh, up and coming sort of legislation around those different areas. We're doing work at the moment, spending the 10 million pounds which has been allocated in the capital programme to accelerate the delivery of things like our EV infrastructure, fleet, streetlights and estates transformation. Uh, we're doing some work to strengthen our policy and strategy focus uh, um, to ensure that our climate ecological uh, issues are reflected firmly in all of our place shaping policies, things like the local plan, economic development, housing, local transport plan, etc. So that will be an ongoing piece of work that, that we'll be developing. And we're also developing, I think this came up previously, a decision tool to try and make sure that we've got a, a tool so that uh, we can understand the impacts of our decisions on climate and ecology so that we can strengthen that particular element that's within our committee reports, but also use that to help us plan uh, more effectively going forward. Uh, and we're obviously planning to strengthen our engagement work and have a greater focus on our ecology and resilience side of things, which, which currently we haven't as much. Uh, so we'll have more on that next, next time. So I have one more slide, which is actually a short video, if, I, if, that's, if that's okay, but it's to give you a bit of a highlight of some of the projects which have been going on through the public sector decarbonisation scheme. Uh, some, of, some of the members may have seen this at a members seminar last week, but so I apologise, but it's quite powerful.
So that, that, was, that was all for me, but I hope that gives you a bit of a flavour of the sort of work seems to be getting really underway now, and um, some great stuff that we've managed to do with that £19 million pounds from government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lichard. Um, is, does Mr Ford need to make any representation at the moment or not? If that's okay, Chair, yeah, if that's okay. Certainly, continue. Yeah, thank you. I'll just, just to, um, just to reiterate really what, um, what, what Anthony's been saying. I think the last sort of, you know, sort of six to six to twelve months has been has seen a real step change. I think in the way that we're we're looking at uh, uh, our operational delivery focus, but also how we're managing that from a program level, but also starting to challenge the way that we we, we you know we, we we're going to be making decisions and making sure that things that might not necessarily seem like they have an impact directly on climate change that we are starting to you know, stress test the impact that those decisions might have on the climate and ecological um, strategy work. And we've been working very closely with people like Peter Hopkins and others as well on some of the um, some of the issues that you, you heard about earlier. But we're also working really, really hard to uh, bring together partners uh, across Dorset as well, because I think as we've articulated at um, the, these committees before that the council has a huge role to play in terms of showing the leadership to decarbonise its own uh, operations, but it's also how it shows that leadership working with others as well, whether that's community groups, uh, parish and town councils or other organisations as well to to help us work collectively to, to, to deliver the changes required. So hopefully you you got a sense from um, the, the reports and also what Anthony just articulated there that we are starting to um, you know, look at it across that whole uh, gamut of, uh, of approaches and I think there's been some some huge strides in, 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 in the last few months which hopefully come, has come out in that report today. Thank you. Thank you Mr Ford. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the portfolio next for any comments. Um, before I do I'd just like to say great video. Mortified that my town, the most beautiful town in Dorset wasn't in there. But uh, with one eye on Councillor Andrews. Um, but it, yeah, it was excellent. And it must be quite gratifying actually as a portfolio holder with those officer teams below you that you now see in the fruition of that work coming forward. Over to you, Councillor Brown. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman and members. Uh, I can sum this up with one word and it's wow. Uh, from where we started to where we are now, uh, the team have done some absolutely fantastic work with very limited resources. And I take my hat off to them because the one thing that we didn't show on that presentation is the work that low carbon Dorsets have also done in enabling us to reduce our carbon emissions. I've said from day one this was a long term project um, and that is still the case. We're trying to bring it forward as much as we possibly can and I will battle relentlessly to make sure I get the support uh, to give to the team because it's so important. This is, this is the future uh, of, of Dorset that we're talking about. And as I say, uh, the work that we've completed already um, is some of the best that I see. I attend a lot of conferences with other councils and we're still way up in the top four or five councils uh, of what we have achieved. And it's something Dorset should be very, very, very proud of. Now, I know we're not doing everything that everybody wants, but uh, I hope that uh, members will understand that um, getting it right is more important than getting it done quickly. Because I've watched other areas that have put stuff into the programme and are now trying to unwind it. We take a lot of care in what we actually do because my, my father, bless him, who died at the age of 95, so you're going to suffer with me for a long time to come, so I'm told by the doctors. I'm sorry about that. Um, but he, even in his 90s, he used to say to me, measure twice, cut once. And that is something that I actually hold very dear to my heart. And that's something that we've done within the climate uh, uh, team, and that's we make sure that what we're doing is good, it's accurate, and, it, and it's long-term. Um, 
as I say, I am so proud of this team. And so when I first took this job on, I thought, what the hell have I got into? Um, now I understand a lot better what we need to do. And I'm going to pass comment to um, the team that worked with me right from word go. And several of them are in this room with me. Uh, when we set forward to try and design a strategy. Uh, that was cross-party, member-led, and I think it proves the benefit of us all working together when we've got a project that is this important. So I'm, I'm not going to talk anymore. You can tell how proud I am, Chairman, and uh, uh, I have every right to be proud of the team. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bryant. Yes, I think you do. And I think um, officers and members across the Council Authority are fully aware this is the legacy we're going to leave our future generations. So the, the work is extremely important that we're doing right now. I'm going to open up to um, non-members of the committee, um, Councillor Heatley and then Councillor Alford. Thank you, Chair. Um, I thoroughly endorse um, Anthony Littlechild's comment that this is really coming together now. Um, it's great to see the three pillar approach, nature and environment and adaptation in there as well. And I look forward to receiving the progress report on that next time. <clears throat> um, I have been going on about management information on this subject for almost as long as I can remember, um, because I felt we were getting a lot of uncoordinated individual numbers with no real context. What we have here does exactly the trick, as far as I'm concerned. It relates what we have done to what we have got to do. It shows how each component is contributing to that overall number of 26%, which is a, a very good reduction in the time. And I think it, it, it is uh, OK. I mean, th there are niggles about it, but it the, the overall approach is right. I hope we can develop an approach like this which works for Dorset as a whole, but I think that may be a great deal more difficult. A few, couple of little points. First of all, what's happened to the old action plan? We had, a, we had an action plan that went with the original uh, strategy, contained a whole lot of individual things, uh, I pick out one of them, ensure procurement specification favours energy efficient equipment. I raised that one because of our last item. Um, and there are about 100 of these things. Um, some of them might look a bit silly now, I don't know. I think that's entirely possible. But I do think that, I, I hope somewhere we are, we are looking at what we've done because there's no point in having these great plans if we don't go back and see whether we've done them or not. Secondly, um, when Ray did his excellent presentation on Thursday, he kept giving us pairs of, I've, we've spent so many million and we're going to reduce carbon every year from now on by such and such an amount. So we had 18 million on the public sector decarbonisation scheme, saving 1,500 tonnes of carbon dioxide. Actually, it's probably cheaper than that because you'll get some money, you'll save some money on the electricity you generate. There was another item that said we'll save, I think, 1,500 tonnes from spending 1 million on building management systems. Now, very rough arithmetic, the public sector decarbonisation scheme was costing us £12,000 a tonne. Uh, building management systems was costing £667 per tonne. What I'm getting at is I think we need to start developing some measures of value for money in this programme, um, which will partly guide what we do. I mean, one's, one's immediate reaction to that is we should be putting building management systems into every building we've got because you get a fantastic bang for the buck. Equally... <clears throat> Um, if the figures are comp comparable, low carbon Dorset's performance in terms of what each tonne of carbon dioxide was, um, um, cost was, was staggering for the Dorset-wide approach. There's clearly something we're doing right there, 
the EU money is pretty much spent. Are we giving thought to the long-term future of that organisation? It seems to me that it, it's an organisation that's uh, learnt how to do it, and uh, it'd be awful pity if we lost it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Heatley. And it always gives me an assurance when you speak and you're in favour of something to do with climate change because I know of your expert knowledge in the field. Um, it's li it's little child, did you want to comment on those, please? Yes, thank you. There's three quite hefty questions there, so I'll try. I'll try my best. Um, so, in terms of the of the uh, initial action plan, so there is a the climate strategy comes with action plans about 190 actions, and they are a mixture of um, the things that we need to do for our own carbon footprint, our 2040 target, our 2050 target, some ecology ones and some resilience ones. What we're trying to do, so we haven't lost sight of those actions. We've been trying to really focus down our, our activity. Uh, with, with the resources that we've got on the 2040 sort of target, our own operational target as an organisation, but we haven't lost sight of the others. So one of the one of the roles of doing a sort of refresh of the strategy is not to rewrite the strategy, but just to reflect on where we've got to with those. Are they the right things? Are we? How does that reflect with current policy, etc.? So we'll, that will be sort of picked up uh, among there. And then, as mentioned before, we can have. A, a wider update on things like ecology and resilience as we sort of move forward. Um, what was the other? Uh, value for money. So that's quite complicated. So uh, each of the different measures that are, that are undertaken to reduce energy energy uh, consumption or to uh, employ renewable energy, each have a different value for money. The public sector decarbonisation scheme had a criteria that overall there was a value for money measure, which was about five hundred pounds per lifetime ton um, and within that you had to balance off some things which cost a lot but had a sort of small financial gain so maybe heat pumps versus some of the things which had a, a low cost real good financial gain such as building management system so through that program uh, the, the, the councils that historically have had a very good building management system program that's been in place for about uh, since about the 80s which has enabled some of the schools in Dorset or Dorset schools in general to be um, identified as the most energy efficient in the, in, the, in England, I believe. Um, so that BMS system is quite old, and part of the public money from the public sector decarbonisation scheme was about trying to upgrade that BMS system, bring it up to date, make it more user friendly, more sort of future proof. So a lot of that money has gone into that, but it's a small proportion of the overall pot because we've also spent money on some of the less value for money things that we need to do to get to our net zero goals, things like the heat pumps or even some of the solar solar projects. Um, hopefully that answers that question a little bit. So, um, and in terms of low carbon Dorset, they, that's an EU funded program which provides sort of energy and uh, support and advice and grants out to organisations across Dorset. So that has, a, um, there's two things related to value for money there. One is the fact that it only provides a part grant. So, so obviously we only provide 40% of the funding for the project. So you get a bigger bang for your buck straight, straight away. Um, and it also has different criteria that are applied. So each project gets assessed for value for money against a set of value for money criteria, which the project has set up. So it's a, it's a brilliant program. It's had a massive impact. And we are looking at how we can carry that on, either through um, looking at prosperity funding or, or similar. Hope that answers. Thank you. Did you satisfy your answer, Councillor Heatley? Thank you. We can now move to Councillor Bryan, it would appear. Yeah, I'd just like to raise one point that Anthony didn't mention. Uh, when we were talking about the strategy and action plan, um, we've got a new member of staff that started last week, so he's now in his second week of being with us, who brings with him both experience of this market experience of exactly what we want to do and uh, it, it, it's a major plus for us as a team um, I've said from word go we need the experienced people and uh, we're, we're bringing them on bit by bit uh, not as quickly as I would like but we're bringing them on bit by bit but I would just like to say to uh, uh, Councillor Heatley that uh, uh, where it's necessary we will make sure that we do what's right to keep us on track and as I say, I'm looking for talent rather than numbers. So uh, as I say, got a new member of staff, 
I won't embarrass him. He sat at the back of the room. Um, but uh, he's, uh, as, I, as I've already found out, he knows an awful lot more than I do, which is exactly what it should be. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, new to Dorset Council. Welcome to Dorset Council. I'll move to Councillor Alford. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, there will be a day when I ask an intelligent question on the subject of uh, the climate change, uh, uh, climate uh, ex uh, strategy, um, but it won't be today. Um, and one of the reasons is that I need to do a bit of work in my own time, just understanding the data that um, is part of this. And I appreciate that we have a data-rich report, and I appreciate the work that's gone into uh, generating that. Yet, reading through it, I was... I thought to myself, what is the source of this data in cases? I was thought, you know, has this data been validated? Um, what is the significance of the data I'm being presented with? So some of these sort of issues, what I call measurement issues, referred to by Councillor Heatley, of course, um, I think are important because I think that um, as time goes on, the better we understand the you know, technicalities, the better the decisions we will make. Um, so that's the main point I think I really wanted to make. In terms of the long term or the short to medium term, perhaps, what I'm interested in is the tight integration of climate change strategy with our operations strategy and also our risk management processes. I think that they do need to be incorporated, be part of each other. And then we can truly say that the climate change strategy is an integral part of our activities of this council. Thank you. Mr. Littlechild. Thank you. Thanks for your uh, question. So um, maybe just I could just sort of fairly simply clarify on the on the data. So there's two sort of essentially two different data sets. The data that we use to monitor carbon emissions for the county uh, is currently comes from national data sets that are provided by um, by Bayes uh, at central government. And they're published every year, but they're two years behind. So it's a slight frustration. You don't get the picture, in, immediate picture. So it's hard to see progress, proper progress. Um, but that data goes through a huge process and it's horrendously complicated. But it, there is data produced for each local authority sort of area, um, which we just extract that information from. For the uh, data for our own emissions, for our 2040 operational emissions, uh, that's basically calculated ourselves from looking, there's, there's, a, there's a set of national uh, conversion factors, if you like, for different things. So an amount of fuel that's used or a unit of electricity that's used. And each year, the government publishes a, how much is a unit of electricity worth in terms of carbon. So we work out, we, we collect data on how much fuel we use, how much electricity we use, how much gas we use, how far we travel, all those sorts of things, and then use that national set of um, conversion factors to work out each of those uh, different elements. But we have recognized that there are some elements in there which we need to get much better at gathering the base data from. So we need to be a bit smarter about exactly how much you know, fuel we use, for example, or exactly how much commuting we do, for example. So currently, that's quite hard to assess. Um, so there's definitely some improvements that, that we need to, need to do. I think in terms of, if I can answer the second question, in terms of integration, um, I mentioned that, there, that we were working in terms of developing a decision-making tool. So, so that will, the purpose of that will be to help to integrate the sort of principles of ecology and climate into uh, our decision-making, but also into our plan development and other things. And there's also a piece of work going on uh, across the council to look at how do we pull together those key, uh, key processes like, like risk management, et cetera, all into one integrated sort of um, process. So, so over time, that will develop into a, an integrated tool of some description, which will hopefully then make sure we've got the links across to things like risk management. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Are you satisfied with your answer, Councillor Rulford? 
Uh, well, yes, I certainly uh, you know, thank you for the answer. Um, I feel as though as time goes on, if I make requests to um, discover the source of data, I hope perhaps you'll be helpful and uh, point me in the right direction. Thank you. Mr. Litchard? Thank you. Um, yes, so, so it's one thing I didn't point out is obviously the report, is, the appendix to the report is, is supposed to be a sort of public facing document. So we have reduced the mass of data that we've got down into a sort of digestible form. So I've, I've got more information if, if uh, required that we can forward on or, have, or pick up offline. Thank you. Councillor Rawford, you can have that. Thank you. The next speaker is. Councillor Andrews, oh, before I go to Councillor Andrews, um, Mr Ford, did you want to add anything at this point? Uh, yeah, just to, uh, I think just to emphasise what, um, what what Anthony said or, already, really, I think one of the, you know, that it's a very good challenge around um, uh, data and, and how we align this with our sort of operational um, and sort of risk, risk management processes, but I think Ant Anthony's Anthony's articulated it, um, you know, very well that we are developing a comprehensive change to the way that uh, we integrate climate and ecological considerations, not only into um, decision making, but also making sure that it's embedded throughout our uh, policy formulation, whether that's for things like the local transport plans or, you know, local plan, and just making sure that we're working as, as best we can to integrate that to make sure that it, it becomes core to to everything we do and I think as Anthony said that will very much um, uh, develop into a, a sort of integrated risk management uh, approach as well so so I think um, we're, we're not alone as an authority in having some um, some data challenges but we absolutely follow what the what the national guidelines are in terms of how you measure your own operational um, emissions and also the, the those at countywide as well so but very very willing to share um, we know where we get our data from, uh, just to make sure that everybody uh, understands how we come into the uh, the conclusions that we are. Thank you, Mr. Ford. And you, you're joining the meeting um, hybrid as, as virtually, so please put your hand up if you wish to speak, and that we'll monitor that. Thank you. Okay, my next speaker is uh, Councillor Andrews. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I have to say, the enabler for this whole contract. Um, uh, and the way we've, we've done things has been the 19 million that we managed to get from central government. So heartfelt thanks go for that, uh, because I think that's been absolutely vital to what we've done. So that was a brilliant enabler to, to get us to where we are today. The targets seem to be getting there. Um, you know, we, we are ahead of where we should be for the, uh, for the initial 2025 target. I think the next bit's going to be the really hard bit after that one. Um, but um, I would also like to thank for the answer on low carbon Dorset, because as you know, or as some of you know, in Sherborne, the most beautiful town in Dorset, that has two castles and an abbey, um, the abbey has um, got air source heat pumps, which was partially funded by low carbon Dorset. And currently there's a big contract going on at the changing rooms at the Terrace Plain Fields, for low carbon Dorset or, or part funding. So a brilliant effort. and. Uh, I, I would hope that every town in Dorset can tap into something along those low, low, I know it's getting near the end of the funded process at the moment, but uh, I would hope that everybody, uh, everybody can um, do that. Uh, can we have a uh, shortened version or, or the video with a, a couple of slides that, that go on to social media? Um, because I don't think we as a council promote our successes well enough. Um, so I would like every town and parish council to at least have this and social media, um, because most town and parish councils have got an environmental committee these days, um, and that would be a great one just to put up for a couple of minutes to say and talk through, because I could talk through the slides um, and show the video, and um, it would be a brilliant, brilliant uh, way of showing our, our uh, commitment to low carbon dorset. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Andrews, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Littlejohn can take that with the comms team. And I, I, I noted you didn't miss an opportunity, Councillor Andrews. Uh, thank you, Chair. The, uh, just that raised a very good point, actually, and uh, uh, 
Andy covered that in the presentation, that we are working very closely with town and parish councils, but if members think that we could do more, then we'd be very pleased. There's a very, very close relation, working relationship at office level and with uh, the association to support town and parish councils with this shared agenda. Thank you. Do you wish to come back, Mr. Littrell? Just, just very briefly to say, yeah, we are, we are planning to do exactly that, to, to make the, 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 the most out of it and to try and share that video we, um, and, and the success of various elements of the programme. So we're upping that social media content. And we've also been having dis some discussions with um, uh, DAPTAC about how we, how we sort of share communications and get messages out to town and parish councils. Thank you. Um, Councillor Took is my next speaker. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I thought that was an excellent report, an excellent presentation, and I'm very pleased that we're getting on with, with, with this job. And Councillor Bryan is quite right uh, on the original EAP's cross-party. They were, they were excellent to start this process off. Um, I've got a couple of points. Um, the first one is, is, is maybe a little bit parochial, but on the, the, the initial slides that uh, uh, Mr. Littlechild showed us, that, that there was some colour coding on the, on the wards. Uh, my, my ward was in yellow, not blue, and I just wondered what the colour coding meant. Uh, the second one is slightly more strategic, which is that we are building, and, and the video is great, we're getting lots of solar panels put everywhere also wpd do do just about uh, come in uh, as well and we've made um sort of strong um uh, depositions to ssen that they 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 need to start engaging with us on a strategic level so that we start to look at the impacts on uh, climate aspirations um obviously our, our developmental pressures that may come uh, down the line as well uh, the economic development challenges and others such as transport and and wider um, electrification of, of multiple systems as well and to be fair to SSE and I think from a very from a very slow start um, the, the the most recent meeting we had of them was was extremely positive and they've now asked us to to, to put forward a uh, uh, a series of uh, uh, propositions that starts to pull all those different elements together to see what what the implications might be for for future investment into the the grid system in Dorset. It is very very early days, but we are trying to be uh, as proactive as we can on a on an issue that is, as I said earlier, is not unique to Dorset. The the grid constraint issues are one that is uh, is 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 nationwide. But I do like to think that we are now on the the, the front foot in terms of cementing those discussions with SSE in, in a way that is far more strategic and aligns with the you know the 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 the, the aspirations of Dorset Council and and a number of our partners as well. Thank you, Mr. Ford. And um, as you're aware, the Vice Chairman and myself had a had a conversation with both yourself and Mr. Littlechild, and we'll speak to members in the offices about that after the meeting and about how that's going to be progressed. Um, Councillor Bryan, I believe you want to come back. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to add that uh, uh, f f f to give people knowledge of what's uh, happening at uh, sort of my level, <clears throat> I meet with Tony Ferrari, which is property and assets uh, portfolio holder, and John Selgren, and we have a number of meetings that we have with different uh, uh, companies who are looking to try and build uh, renewable energy within the area. Those meetings are ongoing and are now starting to pick up a little bit of speed. I noticed that in the press the other day, the first of the uh, um, the floating wind farm uh, turbines uh, is now being towed into uh, operation, unfortunately not in this area. Um, but I haven't given up on, on, on wind farms because it's still probably the most reliable of all the renewable energies. We get plenty of wind down here, and if you don't believe that, come and live with me. You'll soon know what wind is. Um, <laughs> coming up from the south, let me add, I live on top of a hill. Let's clarify that quickly uh, before people get the wrong idea. Um, but uh, no, we're working extremely hard to, uh, to work with uh, uh, pr new providers uh, to bring electricity in. But of course, it is still reliable, reliant on, on the grid. Uh, I'm not going to embarrass her, but we do have a member of staff that used to work for the National Grid, and I can tell you now, John and I are bending her ear as much as we possibly can to uh, get the right contacts in the right places. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Brown. And thank you for the clarification. My meeting, I'll do the jokes. <laughs> Did you want to add anything, Mr. Sogren? No, thank you. Okay. Councillor Took, are you happy with, with that? Yeah, I, I, thank you for that. I, I, at some point, it'd be nice to have some metrics about what the, what the capacity issues actually are and what can be done. Um, so I appreciate the good intentions, and I, I think we've done a lot of work towards it. I just like hard numbers. So I'd, I'd like to have a look at those, at, maybe not now, but at a future point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I can just move to um, at the bottom of page 56 in the report. Um, I just noticed that um, I was just wondering how many forests are we planting on council land and is this being achieved with developers and businesses um, offsetting their carbon emissions through financial contributions? Um, I'm just aware that that's something we do in terms of the carbon sequestration um, and whether or not we're actually progressing with that with that train of thought or doing anything around that. We've got a quite a sufficient amount of land in Dorset that is council owned and developers could be contributing to Dorset Council on their offset and their carbon emissions, I understand it. We could be planting forests. Just wonder if any work was being done around that. So I'm just uh, uh, so in, t in terms of sort of carbon sequestration from from natural assets, if you like, then then we haven't we haven't currently developed a a sort of model as such, uh, but obviously there are contributions being made which we are trying to um, understand through various things that go on in terms of tree planting, etc. What we're also doing is trying to take a sort of strategic look at our at our assets and look at you know, what is the opportunity across our assets uh, for carbon sequestration as well as renewable energy generation and other, other and ecological benefits. Um, and that piece of work is yet to happen, but it's, it's being it's in, sort of in hand. I'm not sure if that answers your question fully or not. But just... Thank you, Mr. Littlechild. I'll let the portfolio come back, then I'll come back. Cheers. Thank you, Chairman. I think it's important to uh, understand that the uh, uh, the situation regarding extending our forest network um, is is covered in several areas. It's unfortunately they all appear in my portfolio, um, but if we look at green space, they are developing areas where we 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 can actually add to the trees we've currently got. Um, the AOMB, uh, I sit on the board. Um, uh, and the chairman or the, uh, the the leader of the AOMB is here today, and I was having a conversation with him uh, because we have a um, a funding called FIPPLE, where we give farmers the opportunity to uh, uh, plant hedges, plant trees, and those grants are being handed out on a on a daily basis. Um, again, that's funding from outside of the council, um, but we do need to do a lot more on this. And what we do need to do is sort out which in, where in the list of priorities this actually sits. Because at the moment, what we're trying to do is grab the low-hanging fruit. Um, and as somebody said earlier on, as we move forward with the programme, it's going to get more and more difficult. Uh, we need to be prepared for that, and we need to get our plans in place uh, sort of uh, within the next 12 months uh, to make sure that uh, uh, this is... Uh, this forms part of the way forward. I am uh, heavily committed uh, to trees. As you know, we're introducing, or we have introduced new policies, whereas if somebody takes a tree down, they're expected to put two back up. Um, I'd like to see that increased, and we will work on that. Um, but that's part of the environment side of my portfolio, not the climate change. Although, I've got to say, environment and climate change is so closely aligned I'm surprised we don't sit them in the same uh, office together because they're, 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 they need to um, be working together. And I've got to say, they are working together. 
I should take the word need out because they are working together very closely. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bryant. Um, Councillor Kenning. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, just, I just wanted to make sure, and I'm sure we've got, you probably are aware, of the arrangement between the, the Dorset County Hospital and the Dorset Town Council about the um, uh, creation of a community woodland on the edge of, uh, on the edge of Dorchester uh, in, 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 as part of the deal with uh, allowing the multi-storey car park to go ahead and the development of the hospital, hospital site. It's a very rewarding partnership. Because I, I, I think, if memory serves correctly, I, th I think we're getting four or five new trees for every one tree that has been removed from the site on, on, the, ho on the hospital. So it's been a very good deal. And, and it does set a good pattern for future uh, pro projects like this and partnerships between other organisations uh, you know, to, to boost Woodland uh, in a major way. Thank you. Did you wish to make any comment? All I'd say is thanks for that. Um, uh, I, I am aware of it, and I think it's a, it, it's a way forward for all of us. Um, if something succeeds somewhere, we need to stretch it across the county uh, and show that... Uh, because if it can work in one area, it can work in a number of areas. And over the years, we've decimated a lot of trees. Uh, we, we, we still do uh, in some areas, but that's a requirement to protect the heathland. Uh, in my own area, we ended up uh, um, under instruction removing a lot of trees. Um, but of course, the heathland is also very good for uh, um, uh, sucking the, uh, uh, the carbons out of the air. But we, we just need to get um, um, more of these ideas coming through. Uh, I put a tremendous amount of pressure on both Stephen and Anthony and the team um, on bringing things forward. I've got to be a little bit more patient um, because they are stretched. But we need to find a way in which we can get resources from other areas to help them. I'm pleased to say, and it's slightly aside to your question, um, Councillor Canning, um, but the teams throughout the council now, are, uh, Anthony mentioned it in his presentation, are all working together um, on trying to do their part in reducing the carbon emissions. And uh, this is a big step forward for, for the council. So I, I feel very confident. And I said I wouldn't take anything on that I couldn't deliver. And I'm still very confident that I will be delivering on the targets that we've set back, set out, um, and for Councillor Healy's benefit, I'm still determined we'll beat the 2040 date. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Did, did you wish to answer? That's okay. Okay. Um, so if I can go to uh, 5.1 in the report, um, just one last question. Are members, members' views being sought as to what's achievable in the wards? Um, to further the work towards zero net carbon emissions? So I'm not sure I've understood the question properly, sorry. It's, it's around whether or not the local members knowledge within their wards is being used by the team where there is opportunities for Dorset Council to work towards their um, eventual targets. Uh, excellent question. Now I'll try and give you an excellent answer. Um, most members keep me pretty well tuned in to what is needed in their area and I pass that back to the team. Um, do we need more? Absolutely, because the local members are essential on telling us where we have opportunities. And uh, I want to see us working much closer with planning, much closer with the planning committees, and certainly much closer with the town and parish councils. Um, in my own parish, um, we use the low carbon uh, scheme uh, to get some solar panels put on the village hall roof. That is proving successful. What I've asked the team to do now, and I'm seeing the first parts of it, is to tell me how much power we're generating and how much that is actually going to save us on the electricity bill. 
and the, and the gas bill, or, or, or on utility bills overall. Um, I've got the first briefing on that, but I've asked for more detail on the numbers. As soon as I've got that, I'll be very happy to share it with members so they'll see what's happening in their own area on buildings that we have already done the work on. Hopefully that answers your question, uh, Chairman. It does, Councillor Bryan. I'm going to put you on the spot now as well because I've been asking for a meeting with you for some time to discuss a, a, an issue around this within my local ward area. So before you leave this building, I want a diary date with you so we can discuss that. Thank you. So as I said, you've, you've discussed this morning about engagement with town and parish councils. Now either I've missed it in the report, but I couldn't actually see it written in the report about that engagement in terms of stakeholders, the, the importance of that engagement with town and parish councils. I'm aware that you are doing the work, but it doesn't, I believe, appear in your report unless I've missed it. I think you, you might be right, it's not possibly not been picked up in the report, it just gives a broad sort of overview, but it was very much focused this time around on our carbon uh, figures more rather than the wider sort of progress side of things. Um, but that bit of work is, is sort of moving on. We've had, had several meetings, had a couple recently to sort of look at how could, we, how could we strengthen that work and how could we work more closely with town and parish councils and how could we maybe bring together a group of town and parish councils to look at what they're doing and how they could share amongst others, etc. So there's, there's lots of opportunities to, to do that and we're just trying to explore how best we can. I am aware that the work is going on, but out of the courtesy to town and parish councils, I would like to see it within within report. They should be given that that sort of um, credibility. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, my councillor Brian. Yes. Sorry, sorry, chair. Um, um, sorry, chairman. The chair's got four legs. You've only got two. Um, but. Uh, uh, to quote somebody else at a different council. Um, I think it's important that uh, we do highlight um, to the town and parish councils, and I've had a number of requests on us revamping the webinar that we gave to members that we can then take to the town and parish councils, and I think that's absolutely essential. We need to keep them informed. We need their support. Um, they are the local information, so uh, I'll make sure, uh, and I'm sure... Uh, John will pick it up with his team, that we, we do a, 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 a report that the town and parish councils can actually see and feel. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I think they should be given that courtesy. They are an elected public body and we should be affording them that courtesy and they should be taking their place at, at the table in full public view. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go to 6.4. And that was, it's about, we've been very successful at attracting funding into the councils we've already heard within, within this, this agenda item. And I've spoken to you and you know that I've had to sign off on in the past about funding because the time frames of it coming in are so short, it doesn't fit in with the calendar of meetings. So I've been in that position um, concerning some of the funding that we've had to bring into this council authority from, from government. But I'm just wondering, while we've been successful to date at getting that external funding, we've had officer teams that have been really good and really efficient at doing that. We've literally had the, the, the plans on the shelf and we pulled them down and said, this is what we want. And we've managed to achieve that sort of funding. And that's all credit to the officers. I've got a concern around the failure to attract that exterior funding. How does, what, what does that create, the potential risk for missing our targets? Has any modeling been done around that? Because at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the target date that we've got is going to be still dependent on a certain amount of external funding coming in. We're still, you know, that's going to be a drip feed. If we fail to start to get to that, where is that going to leave us in actually our performance and achieving the figures that we want within the, within the time frames that we want? Has we've done any modelling around that? Very good question. I shall have a go at answering that. Um, I mean, clearly... I'm happy for you to take that away. I don't want you thinking on the hoof, but I'm perfectly happy for you to take that away, if, that, if, that's, if that's helpful. Yeah, OK. Mr Selgren, then I've got Mr Ford. 
Yeah, I think Mr. Paul might, might wish to say, I, I think, Chairman, that would be extremely helpful because, uh, as uh, it is, as Anthony said, an extremely good question. Um, the reality, of course, is that funding streams are changing fast. We've already discussed one this morning that Councillor Brian raised the transition from the EU funding that we had in low carbon Dorset and what might we might be able to achieve through the UK Shared Prosperity Funding. Similarly, I know Mr. Ford might want to comment on this. I know as we speak, he is looking at a number of emerging funds, uh, I think, uh, being put into place at a national level. And obviously, in result of the uh, of the COP discussions this week, uh, there may be further announcements in government. So I think if, if you'd be willing, Chairman, it might be sound for us to take that question away and provide an update which is fully informed and, and researched and indeed takes account perhaps of the emerging policy position in, in government. But if, if you might just indulge uh, Mr Ford, just if he wishes to add anything to that, but I think my preference is that we'll give you a more comprehensive response uh, after due consideration. Thank you. Mr Ford. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd, it would be remiss of us to say that we've done sort of um, uh, comprehensive modelling, you know, against all of the um, uh, the funding streams that are out there. But just to give you some example, that the the sort of the ten million. Uh, capital programme that we've currently got will pro probably reduce our emissions. We've calculated by roughly another sort of five to six percent. So you do you do get some indication of the the, the scale of what we're looking at just from an from an operational uh, perspective. I think where some of the the, the real challenges are is is there are funding streams out there, but it does take a lot of time and capacity to pull together the 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 the, the actual bids in the first place. And there's also making sure we've got the right level of operational readiness to deal with those bids once once they come in as well, because quite often um, funding uh, timeframes are incredibly short, and and it does put um, uh, real pressure on um, sort of the delivery mechanisms required to get those over the line. But where, where I think there's a real challenge and where uh, I know Councillor Byron's been very strong on is is uh, the, the level of funding to which we can access to, to, to drive some of the Dorset 2050 targets as well. Um, there, there are some huge challenges around areas such as uh, retrofit grid, grid that we've also discussed, but also wider challenges around transport infrastructure. And, and home heating more generally, where without significant um, public and, and indeed uh, private investment as well, it's going to be beyond, uh, I think, the, the the capability of local systems to, 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 to drive those at the speed that's necessary. But we'll absolutely take that away and, um, and give it some more uh, granular level of thought so we can come back with a more rounded answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ford. And if you could also incorporate into that as well, um, Councillor Took made reference earlier to the churn of staff that we have within the Council Authority, and it has, by the performance dashboard, we do have a turnover of staff, which is, at times, it's listening quite alarming. And obviously, within that, we could well be losing officers with, ex with an extremely good experience in, in these um, fund applications. Um, so I'd, I'd like that also incorporated into that as to the risks in terms of the staff. I mean, to get these applications for grants together is quite um, time consuming with staff and the staff are trying to operate and run a council authority at the same time and then having to do that additional work of getting that grant funding applications together. <coughs> so I'd like to take that into the mix as well, please. Thank you. I'm gonna come back to the, to the committee with that. Thank you. Concerning, concerning uh, those grant applications and a failure to get them as to how that's going to impact on us, our delivery times for that carbon net neutral target that we want, and obviously the officers' involvement and how, if we're losing experienced officers, how that's going to impact it as well. And also, um, I would suggest that we also have a review and a look at the progress on the tree planting. I appreciate that's being done in conjunction with the strategy asset management plan, but my feeling is it's what we need to progress at speed. I don't know how the other members feel about that in terms of that tree planting. We've, we've got the land. We know that it, it, it can offset that carbon at a period of time. The quicker you plant the trees, I'm guessing, the more benefit you're going to gain. And, and we're told, aren't we, by the experts within the field that the, the, the clock is ticking and we're actually losing the battle at the moment if the, if the latest news reports are to be believed. So that's two. Has any members got anything else that they would wish to incorporate into that additional review? No? 
Councillor Brown. Yeah, certainly I'll, uh, we'll take those points on board. Um, but I would add one other that, uh, uh, and that's that we make sure we include town and parish councils uh, in all the discussions that are going on. Um, I would point out that planting a tree isn't always the solution. It's the right tree that we need to make sure we plant and plant it in the right place because uh, you can get uh, zero um, uh, benefits from it if you plant the wrong tree in the wrong place. So uh, it's very important that we work with people like the Forestry Commission. I think they're now called Forestry England. I'm never sure of their latest title. I get that with highways as well, um, which is now National Highways. Um, but I think it's important that we all work together. And this is where stakeholder involvement is of absolute paramount importance because we can't do this on our own. And I'll pick on one other point that's been raised. I've said all the way from day one that everything we do is subject to government providing us with the, with the money to do it. Yes, we got the 18, 19 million out of them. That's just the start. We said from word go, we were looking at about 130 million uh, just for the Dorset Council estate. Um, that, ha that number is only going to go up, not down. Uh, so we've got to work hard at getting bids in, but I'm very confident that with the team we've got, um, that we've got the capabilities to do that. But it's something I will watch very carefully. And when we come back uh, to scrutiny next time, um, I'll give you an indication as to what we've actually done. But as I say, I'd just like to add the point on the town and parish councils into, into what you've said, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Brown. So with those um, three further review items, um, I'd the recommendation, if I hear no dissent from members, I take it you're happy with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Before I move on to agenda item 10, can I just thank the officers for the report, the really good report. Um, Mr. Little Child and uh, Mr. Ford, thank you so much. So I move on to agenda item 10, performance scrutiny. So um, committee members to flag up any areas of potential review from the performance dashboard. And given the performance dashboard, we should have Mr. Bonner. Good morning. Oh, Good over. morning, everyone. Hello. Hello. Thank over you, to you, David. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Let me share my screen with you. So. Um, committee have had an opportunity to look through the uh, information in, in, the, in the current dashboard and to identify some areas um, of, of potential further investigation or deep dive. So um, from our conversations, there are five of those areas, um, uh, Chairman. So I will start with the first, which was around um, staff turnover and just bring that up on screen for you. So as we can see on the screen at the moment, we have a number of areas flagged as red for staff turnover, uh, which are currently outside of target. Two of those areas are flagging with the direction of travel, travel which is negative um, as well. Um, so when this was drawn to committee's attention, they flagged it as something that they would like to draw attention to. So uh, back to you, Chair. Okay, any comment from members? Councillor Took. Yeah, I, I, there are a number of complex reasons why we have staff churn. I appreciate that. Um, but looking at the figures for place itself, um, we've got a target of 12% staff turnover. Um, the last measurement I've got September 22 it's 14.84 so that's quite high and it's been consistently high over the periods prior it's been up to 18.8 .8 as a percentage why are we turning over this many stuff I, I, said, I appreciate the reasons are complex but the, if I was to say can you name three main drivers why people are leaving voluntarily and this is it's not people being sat, this is headcount decreasing because people choose to leave. Is it pay? Is it conditions? What's the, th what's the reason why we're getting this churn and how do we fix it? Very simple question, I'm sure. Um, 
I'm, I'm conscious of the fact, Mr. Selgren, you might not have the information. You may need to come back with this. Councillor Canning. Yeah, I, I just wonder, does everybody who leaves go through an exit interview? So we do have data on the reasons they're given that. So that would very, be very helpful if we are going to look into, into this uh, to see the actual explanation of the staff themselves. So we do. So that was that. Uh, Councillor Cunning's predicted my, my response. So we do have exit interview information. Um, and in answer to Councillor Took's question, the reality is it, it is a range of factors. Um, one that is significant, of course, is just bear in mind and this council is not atypical, the, the age profile of the organisation. Um, the level that's set, by the way, and the target, as members will know, um, there, is, there is turnover, partly as a result of those sorts of things, of people leaving and, and for uh, those who retire and those who move on to, to new, new roles for career progression. Um, and that's why the, the level is set at the, at the level it is, because there is what is regarded as a healthy level of turnover to ensure that the organisation refreshes and we bring in uh, new talent and, and expertise and indeed uh, new entrants to the local government uh, um, market. I think probably you're right, Chairman. The answer to this is I would, it would be ideal if I had my uh, HR business partner alongside um, Emma who would give you a full account of this because she does look at all of that and I, we receive at the board level uh, information about that, but I don't have that to my fingertips this morning. I think if I may, Chairman, I'd, I regret that because as you know, what I've tried to do through the rest of this agenda is, is give members full and frank uh, information about the questions of which you've asked, but on this particular one, I simply don't have the level of uh, information either in my head or at my fingertips and what I wouldn't want to do uh, in response to what is, is a really critical question about the, the health and well-being of the organisation that I want to give you a, a correct and accurate position because I know when members want to move with this, what you want me to do is, is to explain the circumstances and then to, to use that scrutiny process to say, actually, Mr Elgin, could you consider doing X, Y and Z in order to deal with that? I think I'd just, just before closing on this particular point, um, whilst well, Councillor Took's right that we are a couple of percentage points above the, the desired target level, it is only a couple of percentage points. That is significant because certainly if that's indicative of a trend, then it's something we'd want to address early in the process. But I think probably the best bet is, is if I do invite um, Emma to, to respond to you, to you next time and indeed perhaps to bring a report on, on this and other matters you may raise in this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. Councillor Took. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, it's simply a, a comment. Um, yes, it's a few percentage points. Um, the difference between 12% and 18% is 50%. So it, it, it is a significant uh, uplift. Um, so I'll I, I just make that point. Uh, th and thank you for answering, Mr. Selgren. I don't expect you to be a fountain of all knowledge all the time. So yeah, I, think it, I, I think it would be beneficial probably to bring it back to the committee. And we'll have a discussion around that with the forward plan. So I give this is a, a technical matter when on, on which you need the precision of the information. I would be only well advised to, to come on with, with the HR business partner who can give you a full account. Uh, and we'll, we'll do that together. Thank you. If we've got other members on this particular point, I'll go back to Mr Bonner. Thank you very much, Chairman. So um, in, in, in the same spirit of things, um, the committee has looked through these as items to add to the potential items to add to a forward plan for further consideration. So uh, the next one was around the latest quarterly results for um, accidents, riddle reportable, near misses and non-reportable accidents. Um, and again, we have uh, these are currently flagging as red on our on our RAG status um, with a negative direction of travel as well. Um, committee asked me just to put these up consideration on the screen um, and uh, just to note that we scroll down here uh, some of the numbers are relatively high um, or certainly seeing an increase on where we've been um, if I just put the, put the graph up there the light blue is the current figure and the dark blue is this time last year Okay, thank you, Mr. Bond. That's noted. Um, also, can we move to um, staff sick leave as well, please? We can look at staff sick leave, yep. Okay, so bear with me a moment. Just a, quick, a factual question, actually. When we refer to employers, are we talking about direct 
uh, staff members only, or do we count subcontractors in, in that as well? Mr. Bonner, did you hear that? Could you, were you able to? I, I did hear that. Apologies. I'm just uh, just focusing on this. Uh, yes. Uh, so my understanding is that we don't include uh, subcontractors on that. Um, I, I don't know if Mr. Selgram might like to correct me on that, but my understanding is that, that these um, these figures don't contain the sub subcontractor numbers. Although I'm happy to go away and, and double check that and come back to the committee on it. Okay. I have on screen now the sickness figures. Uh, again, these have been flagged as red. However, the direction of travel is improving on these figures. Uh, again, um, we agreed to do a quick run through just to show that they are currently red. Um, I think there's only one at the bottom there which is currently flagged as, as amber. And of course, for concern, everything else is showing a, an improved direction of travel. But they are still higher than, than we would expect. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. Mr. Selgren, Mr. Selgren, do you want to come in at this point? So, Chairman, I think again this is going to go back to the same point. I think if you're if you're willing, what would be helpful this morning, if you can, if we're, we're flagging the issues that are red, um, certainly Emma and I can bring you a full comprehensive report on on those issues because a number of these actions has been taken. So, certainly in relation to. Both long and sh we, we we separate uh, uh, long and short term sickness because the dynamics of, of each are slightly different. And we've got a we've got a more detailed breakdown of the causes. There's been doing quite a lot of work actually within the directorate around uh, some of the principal causes. A lot of that's uh, musculoskeletal, as you'd expect, in the more manual areas of, of the of the of police directorate, uh, and then actually an increasing level which we are monitoring and indeed taking some very um, clear action around uh, stress, uh, anxiety, mental health related conditions. Um, and again, it, I would like to bring you a report on that because I think it is something that's important. At the end of the day, members are, are the employer. Um, it is important that you, you've got the information about that and similarly that we give you a very clear account of the things that we've done. And indeed, because all of you bring that wider experience, I would genuinely welcome uh, thoughts that you may have about further actions that we could take. We are confident the things we're doing are comprehensive, but as ever, I remain open to the fact that there could be things that we could do to further improve the situation. So if you'd be willing, Chair, I think all of this is speaking to the same thing. We need to come back with a, a more detailed report to, to respond on, on these matters, which we, we can do. Just, just to clarify, Mr. Selgren, Mr. Selgren it, was, it was only whether you want to make any comment or not. This isn't for debate now. This is to forward up our for a forward plan. Yeah, yeah, which is why I said I didn't need an answer, answer now. Um, Councillor Andrew. Yeah, it would be interesting, John, when the uh, HR come and do that report, is how many collective hours for a break, I don't know if you can break down in the department, but then you'll see kind of like where we're short staffed already, we're, we're even shorter staffed because we've got levels of sickness and we need to find out the reason why. Probably all genuine reasons, but um, we just need to see if we can take some corrective action to do something about that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Uh, Mr. Bonner, can you continue? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, the next one was around some of our mandatory training, uh, specifically around data protection mandatory training, uh, which is currently uh, showing as off track uh, on our action status, negative RAG and negative direction of travel. Um, there's an explanation in there around how the training um, was a two yearly requirement and has now become a yearly requirement, which may be. Um, requires some further promotion for people to understand that, that, that there's a requirement for that. Can I just ask, Mr. Bonner, this is this is officers and members? This is just officers. Councillor Andrews? Yeah, I have to say, um, since we've changed the provider of the members' training, and I do believe the officers are doing the same training, I am very, very delinquent in doing my training. Um, <laughs> like eight modules, I think. Um, I don't know why, but I haven't managed to pick up the box six one. I clicked into it, and it, it is an issue. Um, but um, yeah, since we've changed the provider and the timescales that you provide, you require to do the training. In, I am just so delinquent on my training; it's unbelievable. So I think it will be a mandatory thing. Um, but uh, yeah, just made that comment. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Um, I've been slightly remiss because mine was arriving in my junk folder. I was completely oblivious to it. Uh, Mr Selgren. Thank you, Chairman. So, the, the, in a sense, the same response is going to apply because the mandatory training is just that. So, it's a test against 100% attainment. So, again, uh, we've been doing some focus work around this. Two, two issues. One is obviously a lot of our staff are not office-based workers, so we need to find different ways to enable them to, for that training to be delivered. But these are and important areas in, in, in match training, um, uh, health and safety, safeguarding, those sorts of things. So it, it is, it is it, that's why we keep such a close track on it. Again, let me add that to the list that we'll put into the comprehensive report. Thank you. Mr. Sargon, I think what we highlighted in the meeting as well was Obviously, we're an authority that is, there is a continual risk of cyber attacks presently globally, um, particularly with what's going on globally at the moment. And that doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon in terms of those types of cyber attacks. And as an authority, we're at risk of that. So it's obviously an intrinsically pe important piece of work. Thank you. Mr. Bonner, sorry, Councillor Kenning. Sorry, just, just, just one point actually, uh, we, we now we've raised it. Um, I don't know if it's just me, but the actual um, training modules that they send out. Uh, the first few, I just parked them because, to be honest, they look like spam. They look like exactly the sort of thing that we're told we're not supposed to be uh, opening and stuff like that. So I, mean, I, had, I had the mentally thought, I'll get in contact with somebody and ask. It, 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 it's legit. And then I forgot to get around to asking anybody. So I just wonder if anybody else has had a similar impact. And that's why perhaps return rates might be quite as low. Yeah, I, I, I must admit, I asked Haley myself as to whether I could open it or not when the first ones come through. Um, Mr. Selgren. Thank you, Chairman. So I'm just, just checking Mr Mayor's not still with us, because this falls under his area as the Data Protection uh, Supreme Member for Council. Um, so I had exactly the same experience, Councillor Canning. Um, what happened was we changed our provider, the cyber security training, from one to another, and the name that came in. So I did exactly the same as you did. I ignored the first few on the basis I assumed this was to test whether the previous training had been effective, and would I respond to such a, an invitation to... Uh, uh, click onto a link. Um, we had a very uh, well-informed discussion at SLT about this with uh, Mr. Mayor and others who've been involved in the project. Um, and points well made, actually, about that, that, that it's, since it's, it sort of made the point it did work. Um, the Boxfish now is the council's preferred supplier. So again, I think many of us, now we know that is the case of responding to those those requests. But again, perhaps this is one that Mr. Mayor, I'm sure, would be very pleased to, to update you on um, at a subsequent meeting. Thank you. Um, Mr Bonner, can you continue, please? I can. OK, so and the, the final area that the committee drew to, uh, was, was drawn to committee's attention was around um, the uh, level of overdue subject access requests, um, um, which you can see on screen there at the moment, currently both flagged as off track uh, with a negative rag and a negative direction of travel. Um, so obviously, the target on those are, is zero, um, and it's it's above zero at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. If members are happy to, um, um, Mr. Mayor, the, the Chief Monitor Officer has had to leave the meeting because he's got another meeting that he's had to go to, that he's had to attend. And if members are happy to, I've arranged that I'll have a conversation with Mr. Mayor outside of this meeting with a view to getting him to bring a statement to this committee, much along the same lines as we did with Miss Evans's team over the land search charges, um, and if and from that statement, then we, then we can then evaluate as to whether or not we need to drill down into any areas. Are members happy with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Selgren. I just want to check one. I would just advise the committee to, because it mercifully isn't shown on, but with pleasure, it isn't shown on this uh, particular chart. Is the, is the achievement we have in relation to the. Um, betting and barring, uh, the DBS checking, uh, which is obviously something that is critical in children's and adult services, but actually is equally critical in, in many of the place services. So we've done a lot of work over a period of time to ensure that our compliance with DBS is very, very tight indeed. But I might suggest that that is something that committee should also include within the HR report that you receive in relation to place, because that is one of the areas that I would advise members need to have a very, very close oversight of because it's one of those things that if, if it does start to go out of kilter, this will attract significant external interest from people like Ofsted. Uh, and I would advise that you as a scrutiny committee need to be cited on that because making sure that it is in the place it needs to be is a, is a key role for a, for a scrutiny committee. So with your agreement or your approval, I would add that to the suggested report. 
Thank you, Mr. Selgren. Yeah, I agree with that. Just picking your brains, and you may, I appreciate you might not know the answer, and it might be one for Mr. Mayor, but as a council authority using other stakeholders or other partners, we can't enforce on them for them to take a DPS check. This is only our own staff and our, and our own members that we can make, ensure that they take a DPS check. Outside bodies, we're, we're not able to do that or insist on that. So my understanding, I'm sure you, Mr Mayor, will, com, will confirm, but each individual organisation is responsible for its own DBS checking. It's effectively an employer responsibility. OK, thank you. So I, th I think members are in, in agreement with that. Yes. Yeah. Councillor Took. Whilst that is clearly the case, surely if we're engaging with third parties, one of the conditions that we impose upon them in order to do business with them is that their employees are DBS checked. And, and so they, they, the point then becomes moot. If, if we insist that they're DBS checked, it's up to them to do it. Great, yeah. Sorry, you, you didn't want to make a comment? Just so that's, that's correct. So, so it is. If, so as, as Council Took is indicating, that's a contract compliance issue. So where the council contracts with a third party, there are sets of standard sets of clauses, and where it is appropriate, D, DBS checking to take place, that would form part of the contract compliance process. Thank you. So, Mr. Bonner, was there was there anything else? Uh, no, no, Chairman. That concludes the areas that were identified for any further consideration. I will pause, however, in case anyone has come up with any, has had a, had another look. Uh, I'm happy to drive it to somewhere else on the dashboard if there are any other areas. Okay. Um, Councillor Took, I was about to ask if any members had anything else they want to come on. Councillor Took. Thank you, Chair. There, um, th there was one area on the dashboard I wanted to have a quick look at, um, which is um, operational place. Um, <clears throat> operational place um, and there's a PL31A and PL32B which have to do with uh, percentage of household waste sent for reuse, recycling, composting and kilograms of residual waste which are brilliantly on target. I can't fault them. Um, having spent a number of years in sort of sales management and things like that, if the sales team is hitting target and not exceeding target, my normal instinct is to give them a stretch target. Um, and, and just to make sure that they are doing everything they can. Um, it, 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 it's, I, I'm not saying they're not working, but it, it's, it's just these things strike me as a little suspicious. When we're, when we're looking at, uh, at targets and meeting targets. So, you know, I say, in my previous life, I would, I would stretch the guys, increase their targets. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Took. I think it's something that Mr. Mr. Selgren will take away and have a talk with his team around. Um, Indeed, Chairman, it's a whole other meeting. If, if the committee would like a report on that, um, Chairman Clinton and her team would be very pleased to present that. But just a quick observation I'll make in response to Councillor Took's question is, of course, we do benchmark ourselves externally and nationally against recycling targets, and indeed, we make certain reports into government on that matter. So, but if you would like a report on that, because I know, I mean, Gemma and the team are actively looking at that very issue about, how, you know, Council actually performs extremely well on this, and the community that performs very well. How do we go that next step? So, if you would, if you would like, then that is, is something we can we can offer. No, not today, no. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Yeah, I will just confirm what Councillor Cook has just said. That is too perfect, you know, and it raises suspicion. So, um, yeah, okay. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Um, Mr. Bonner, there was there was a couple um, points that were raised previously. And I think you were going to ask some questions around it. And it was PL22, planning decisions overturned at appeal, but there's no data on. And PL23, number of homes built in the DC area that was no data on. I appreciate this is a bit of a moving feast, this um, performance dashboard. I just wondered whether you had an update on that or when we could expect those, those figures. So I am actively looking into those ones before you, Chairman. Um, the second one of those is an annual figure. So we'll only populate once a year. Um, 
I have a feeling that PL22 is as well, but I will confirm back for you. Okay, thank you. Does, Mr. Selgren. Chairman, I do, I still remember remembers the correct my, my memory, but I had a feeling we've taken a report to either your committee or some committee relatively recently on the matter of housing completions. Um, so I can happily go away and just check, because if, if, if we have and it's in, a, in, in the public domain, then of course this committee can, can have a look at that. But that data is there, there was a, there's some detailed work being done. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. Yeah, I believe the data is there somewhere, but we just haven't populated it into the dashboard yet, because obviously, as I say, it's a moving feast and they're still populating various information, but it was something that came up within discussions that, that, that those tables were actually blank, so Mr. Bonner was going to wait to investigate it. Yeah. Okay, so Took. I, I think Mr. Selgren is quite right. We did look at housing completions quite recently. And one of the problems, of course, with housing completions is they are not within the gift of the council. They are within the gift of developers. And, and, and that is a big red flag for me because if we don't meet the housing delivery test, developers can build more houses without proper planning control. And if they don't build them, they get the opportunity to, to sidestep it. So I, I, I'm very exercised about that as an issue. I'll get off my hobby horse now. Okay. Um, so I think there's another question from Mr. Bonner. No? Okay, Mr. Bonner, thank you to you and you and your team. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for attending. Okay, thank you. So if I move to agenda item, oh, big pardon. Yeah. So so we've uh, established those various areas that we want to take to the forward plan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if I move to agenda item eleven. Um, Place and Resources Scrutiny Committee forward plan. So, I don't know, are we able to get the forward plan up on the screen? Yes. Yeah, three moments. <laughs> well, I think members are, I'm mindful of the time, members are aware of the forward plan and we have a conversation around that in an informal meeting as well. We've got those others that we're going to populate onto it. Um, obviously, we're looking at a, a, situ over, a situation over prioritising because we're getting quite an extensive forward plan now. So I'll leave that item there if members are happy with that. Yep. Okay, so we'll move to agenda item 12, the cabinet forward plan. Um, and to commit to use the information to identify, identify potential areas of post-decision review. So, does any member have anything within the cabinet forward plan that we'd like to look at? Councillor okay, Andrews. So, Chair, the uh, 20 mile an hour policy that's recently gone through cabinet, um, 20 mile an hour policy, uh, is that on somewhere on the forward plan? Uh, I, th I think it needs to be kind of like a little way out to see how you've, how they're getting on um, with it. Um, but um, six months, ten, nine months, something like that. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Um, like you, I attended the Cabinet meeting, and I did request in the Cabinet meeting that we would have a statement to this scrutiny committee to give us an idea of how it was going after a six, six months after the um, policy had been implemented. Um, the leader of the council was going away to have a discussion with the portfolio holder around that. My view is still, Mr. Selgren, that um, after six months we should get a report to this this committee, a, not a not a full agenda report, but just a statement to let us know how it's going. Um, because if the wheels are coming off of it, no pun intended, at that early period, then obviously we're going to need to bring it to scrutiny because it's impacting on uh, parishes and towns throughout the Dorset council area. Okay, so point well made. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Um, does any Councillor Took? There is a, a, an issue on the uh, cabinet. There is an issue on the cabinet plan, um, which is to do with foster care um, and a proposal to increase fees. Could we have some feedback in a few months' time as to what the effect has been? on the number of foster parents coming forward 
and the number of children that were getting into foster homes um, moving forward. So just, just to keep an eye on how that's working because fostering is one of the more significant issues in terms of getting children looked after properly. It, we're corporate parents, but we're, we're employing, I guess foster parents are also corporate parents. They're, they are acting as parents. We need to make sure they're supported properly and that we're getting enough people coming forward to look after the children that need fostering. So I, I just want a, a deeper dive into that in a few months' time, and we can see the effect of any cabinet decisions. Th thank you, Councillor Took. Um, we'll pass that on to Councillor Jill Taylor's, because um, it's for her scrutiny committee for people and health. Okay, thank you. I think the um, financial monitoring report, but I believe that comes to us anyway. Yeah, so that's the only one. Um, presently, I guess one we're going to have to look at in the future will be the fees and charges policy as well when that comes through. Um, I don't know whether there is the executive director. You've got any other further recommendations? No. Okay. So if members have no other further comment on that. Then I'll move on to agenda item 13, which is urgent items. You'll be pleased to hear there are no urgent items. And agenda item 14, exempt business, and there is no exempt business. So thank, thank you, officers and members, for your time. And I'll close the meeting after 20 to 3. Thank you.